Well, good morning. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to our 2018 Leadership and Annual Meeting. Um, I'd like to start off, first of all, by introducing the uh, board members that are present. I think most of you know uh, myself, Ray Stanley as president, uh, Al Sweeney uh, as vice president, uh, Kevin Woods was on an airplane last night from Kansas City and got in about 3 a.m. this morning, so he's not with us. Uh, Doyle Punches, our, our treasurer. Um, Amy Darnell, Amy's back in the corner. Robert Palmer. Uh, Robert works in the conservation area with Flint. Where's Bo at? Right there. Bo Rosa. Petey, director of fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. John Plaza. Great. Not with us today is Flint. Uh, he, his eldest son is preparing to get married. So they're making wedding plans this, this Saturday. So I think that sort of takes priority over some of this off-road stuff. Um, Lucas is not with us today. He's got dad duty. Uh, his wife is in retail and uh, this is a very intense time of the year. So uh, I, I'm sure that he will be streaming with us on Facebook. And Walter, which is our personality. Um, he just got off a cruise ship with his family, so he's on his way home right now. So anyway, um, I also would like to identify very briefly as we get started this morning, uh, a number of past presidents that are with us today. Uh, Brent Galloway, Bob Yarborough, Gary Parsons, uh, Jay Bird is online. And one that's not with us, and I'm not sure how much people are aware of this, but I will, will share this. Uh, Roger Thor, one of our past uh, presidents, uh, had his last chemo treatment on Tuesday of this week. So obviously he's recovering from that, and our thoughts and prayers obviously go with uh, Roger. At this point, I'd like to ask Gary to come up and uh, start us off with a brief prayer to start our meeting today. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each and every one in this room and the contributions to the off-road community that we support. We thank you that we live in a country that we have the freedoms to do this and ask that you be with our country, its leadership, and the military around the world and domestic that keeps us safe. But most of all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and we ask that you be with us each day, and we ask this in his name. Amen. Can you tell if Jeffrey's online? Jeffrey is online. Okay. Jeffrey, are you with us? Uh, we're we're going to do our order of uh, presentation day a little bit differently. As, as many of you know, um, uh, we've been very involved in the last two years in the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway. And uh, not moving. Jeffrey, can you hear us?
while we try to make connection with Jeffrey, one of the things we want to do this morning is bring everyone up to date on the status of the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway and specifically our legal uh, challenge on the access to the right of way at Mountains uh, Springs Road. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> Where we are right now is um, we've progressed over the course of the year through a series of steps and as anyone that's ever worked through legal processes, it, it's a long drawn out affair. Uh, we had a hearing back in September, then we had a status hearing in early November. At the same time of the status hearing uh, of all the uh, evidence that, that has been placed in, in, in place, um, we had elections there in the uh, local area of, of Slade, Kentucky. One of the challenges that we've had in that area is the uh, judge executor and the, and the county attorney have not necessarily been the friendliest foes as we work through this whole process. Well, one piece of positive news from a political point of view, they both lost their election okay in November and we have two new individuals a new judge executor and a new county attorney and not yet determined on the county attorney but we do know on some previous history that the new judge executor is at least a friendly personality to the off-road community and so if we look at that as a very positive situation the junction we're at now um, one more Then you gotta go back because it should have. Uh, there's a series of. It's <coughs> really well, where, where we are is that we are approaching Monday to be specific, a time when we need to submit what we call expert disclosure uh, documents, and of what. The one piece that we're working on in terms of the expert disclosure, and this was drafted Friday, is that we are contracting a, uh, a Kentucky-based surveying company to go in and do the physical hard survey of the Mountain Springs Road and the points along those private property lines that can be submitted to the court to basically substantiate our claims. Um, the court has found in, in the status to date that we do, we, Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, do have standing, okay, in the challenge as to represent our members and <coughs> landowners in, the, in that area. Um, one of the things in the discovery phase that we're working through right now, uh, the final deadline on discovery is December 31st uh, of this year when we need to present that survey. Um, our friends at the Ohio River Four Wheelers uh, are stepping up to fund the cost of that survey, which right now is estimated roughly at $2,500. Uh, that is a huge thing, because you'll see in a moment, you know, we're, we are accruing some very substantial legal bills as we build toward, toward this case. Um, what, where we're pointed at right now, once, once the uh, discovery deadline comes and goes on 1231, we are going to be scheduled for trial in Slade, Kentucky on April 9th to 11th, 2019. And so that's, that's the junction that we're leading up to. Um, and next slide. Just to give, give you, and you'll see this as we work through the financials today on the association, um, this year alone, we have. I don't know what it's doing, but I just bear with you. Okay. This year alone, now there, you got it working there now. Mm -hmm. um, this year alone, we've spent a little over $56,000 um, of money <laughs> to fund the building of our position in this legal challenge. And I share that with you because to let you know as we go through this, 
one of the things that we got to look at is the overall impact, and, and I'm going to address in a moment, uh, the challenge of sustainability. Because when you make this kind of investment, one of the challenges that we must also take into account is, is this sustainable long term because of the dollars involved? <clears throat> We also received um, from the United Four Wheel Drive Association, and we'll do talk with, about them a little bit later as well, a $5,000 award toward our legal fund building on the Mountain Springs Road case. Uh, we've also got some dialogues going on with a couple other national uh, groups, including Orba and so forth, for hopefully some potential funding going into 2019. One, one, one additional thing on the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway, it was, it was awarded this year, the 2018 Orba Trail Award. This is the first year for that award. And so we're continuing to build the recognition of and, and the, uh, uh, the knowledge of this as a riding destination there in eastern Kentucky. <clears throat> We just talked about the survey, and, and that survey work is going to be contracted through DBL, our law firm. The uh, reason we're doing that is that it allows us to have client um, lawyer confidentiality and communications internal to those communications. Whereas if we did it directly to, to the surveying company, the same confidentialities don't exist, okay? Uh, so we're really trying to protect what I'm going to call it is intellectual knowledge that we collect out of the survey as we go toward the discovery deadline in December. I mentioned sustainability. Um, this was brought up in some, some dialogue um, earlier this week, and I, I really think it's a, a, a real good question to address, and we're certainly open to <coughs> questions as we, go, as we go through this. The, the strength of what's going on there in eastern Kentucky is that prim the, the primary routes are already actively being maintained by the local county road departments uh, as well as the U.S. Uh, Forest Service and volunteer efforts from groups like ourselves, Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Um, this year alone, for example, the United States Forest Service, Daniel Moon National Forest, has spent roughly $40,000 in the peripheral service roads of repairs and so forth of access in and out of the Daniel Boone National Forest. Um, we've also gotten extreme cooperation from the Powell and Lee County uh, particularly, okay? And, and to date, when we've identified troubled areas along the route, uh, they have stepped in and with their county uh, assets, been able to go in and make repairs, adjustments, and so forth. So we've got a really, I think, a really strong base built there on a local political basis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, the November election, we really think uh, that also leads us down the road to a, a much stronger future. <coughs> the uh, the access and legal issues like Mountain Springs Road that we're currently in, uh, we, we, we believe that this really is the, the pivotal case to set the precedent that going forward we can, we can put our hands on to continue to build miles. For example, Jeffrey and his team, and it's too bad he's not logged in with us, but um, they are actually in Slade today. We currently have 111 miles mapped, okay? But they're in Slade today looking at an additional 60 miles of trail, and they believe that we can bring that 60 miles on before the end of the year. Before we jump over, any other questions that, yeah, David? Just a, just a, for those who are not familiar, just a very brief, and I realize it's complicated, but just a very brief, what is that access issue that we're fighting about? Yeah, repeat the question. Uh, David's asking, what exactly is the access issue? There, there's two private landowners, okay, that have encroached on the legal right of way and are claiming that as private property. The maps, and Joe and Aaron 
help correct me if I go off stream here a little bit because it is complicated. But but the maps going back into the 30s, okay, show the pin locations, okay, and what is the public um, what is the public domain of that road. Um, and so one of the landowners, for example, actually gated one portion of that uh, in there's been a series of legal challenges with himself and the local government there. Um, the, you know, see the name, the Moes, you know, they've been our thorn. Um, and then we also have a land company there that is also encroached onto the right of way. We were able to prove in previous court findings that there has been continuous use of that public road over a 15 year period, the most recent 15 year period. And in supporting the case, we submitted, I want to say in excess of 40 affidavits of local residents that documented the use of that public road. And really what we're fighting for is to keep that public road open and not have to go back in, regress back. So. Understood? Anything else? But I think it's really important because I think this really is, I mean, we talk about, you know, why why do we exist and, and, you know, what are we all about? You know, we're all about riding. We all want to go play. We, we all want to be like Pete, okay? But the, but the reality is, you know, at the core of it is you look at the core values of our association and it's conservation, it's education, and it's recreation. And this, you know, I really feel as we've gotten into this very deeply over the last two years, I mean, this is at the core of why we exist. Um, real briefly, I, we mentioned um, the Daniel Boone National Forest. I'm going to ask Aaron to uh, interject some things here in a moment. Um, we, we continue to build a really good relationship uh, at the local level with the, with the ranger and his team of people. Um, you might want to address Carburetor Hill. Sure. Okay. Aaron Roddy. Just in case. Aaron Roddy is present for a lot of the Hopefully you guys can hear me, but um, just to give you a little background what's going on. Um, Carburetor Hill currently, right now, where we're waiting on the county. They have to survey the property um, that they're looking at, um, and it has to be within an 80-20% of what the Forest Service values the carburetor property at. Um, once that happens, then it goes through a legal process that can take anywhere between three and five years um, at the national level. And eventually what will happen is they'll swap properties and the county will take over the carburetor property and the Forest Service will take over what the county gives them. And um, as you can see up here on the slide, you'll see Hollywood Off-Road Adventure that uh, Carburetor Hill sits right next to their property and that uh, park is owned by four different counties so once the counties uh, receive that property it will be added into the park and then we I will think have to put that put that in perspective for some people that don't know the local terrain up there Carburetor Hill to the Daniel Boone is a lot like lower two was to us that know Telica it's that it's that that place that landmark trail that uh, has been there forever. Yeah, um, but like I said, we're looking at a three to five year process. It's not quick because you have to go through all the political paperwork. Um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'll go ahead and like um, with Harwood Park, um, like we said, that uh, is ran by four different counties right now um, within the area. They just opened up <coughs> in Labor Day weekend. Um, they have a six year contract and they're in their fifth year. They just opened up. So um, currently, right now, um, yeah. But currently, right now, we're working with the park um, to establish a trail system and get them up and running. Um, I know High River Four Wheelers, Kentucky Crawlers, we sort of uh, made a little bit of donation for they can get some merchandise, for they can make money off the merchandise and go back into the park. Um, but, um, and then there's another park that's right next to it called Boneyard, and um, we're working with them. They've been a little bit hesitant for the clubs. Um, they're a private park. Um, that's about eight, well, roughly now about 1,500 acres. Um, 
and uh, we just got done to work on a price for uh, one year uh, from the day you buy your pass. It's hundred dollars for the whole year, um, and then hardwood is uh, fifty bucks for the whole year. But when you take those two parts and you combine them, if you buy a pass for both parts, you're almost looking at six thousand acres to ride. Um, then, like we said, you know, you take in your private land that's up there that. Um, we've got a lot of permission to ride. You're looking at 15,000 acres total. So, um, you know, just with the DBB, that's brought a lot of uh, positive impact with the county. They're starting to buy into the off-roading, starting to support it. Now they want uh, a tourism board to reach out to us, and they want us to be on their tourism board to get them coming in. So, um, if anybody has any questions or wants to know about parts, I'll be more than welcome to reach out and I'll give you any uh, any information I can. Uh, yeah, do a little summary of the meat ride while we're oh. the day. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, we had the uh, third annual Southern Four Wheel Drive Meet and Greet Ride uh, November 1st weekend up in uh, Natural Bridge area. Um, it's been a big, huge success every year. Um, we pulled in close to 250 rigs for just for the meet and greet ride. Um, this year we did do a $20 charge for all the rigs coming in, and the reason we did that was um, the Hardwood Off-Road Park gave us the whole park for the day free at no cost for everybody that came up the road. Um, so all that money actually is going to go back into the community. Um, prime example, over a thousand dollars is going to the children's home in the area, um, and then uh, five hundred and fifty dollars is going to go to the off-road park um, because that is not a private off-road park. That's actually coming out of all the tax. Um, money. The counties pay, uh, just give me an idea, $80,000 a year for that park. So um, a little bit there and then actually um, we're going to give $550 back to Southern Four Wheel Drive. So again, uh, I think we got it on for 2019, the fourth year. That will be the first weekend in November again. So come on up. Um, We've got it worked out now. We're almost, uh, you don't, if you're in a side by side, we can make, get you around and let you ride the area without getting in trouble. <laughs> so, um, I, I will share on the side by side, which we'll touch on a little bit later, too. We actually had a side by side lead ride as part of the meeting ride this year. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to build bridges. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Hey, Bo. Yeah. You... Uh, with the meet and greet ride, we're going to turn it into a two-day event this year coming up. So you guys that travel eight hours, you'll actually have two days to ride. Yeah. We'll get into that when we get into the calendar part. Thank you, guys. Can I have one minute? Sure. You, you, you never, never take one minute. <laughs> Start the timer. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Kling, uh, Vice President of Harbor Forums. Uh, every year after the meet and ride event, uh, I do a economic impact to the community. And I took my first cut at it uh, last week, sent it out to a couple of my guys who were on the committee. They recommended some revisions, changes, additions, and a, a pretty moderate estimate of our economic impact to the community. You know, we bought hotels, we bought cabins, we bought primitive and motorhome hookups. We did hundreds of meals. We purchased thousands of gallons of fuel. And a, a reasonable moderate estimate of our economic impact is over $50,000 that we put back into the slave community for a one day event. So give yourselves a big round of applause. That's huge. Minute ten. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's huge. And one of the things, and when I talk about Namrack in a little bit, one of the things that I learned when I attended the uh, Namrack meeting in November, or actually in October this year, um, came across some technology out there called a trail counter. And basically, this is a device that you can you can buy and bury in the trail system and extract the data via Bluetooth that helps you know, basically confirm economic impact. And it's an incredibly, so $350 a unit. So it's not a huge investment, but 
we'll deal with that going forward. What's NAMRAC? The North American Motorized Recreation Council. I'd like to ask Bo to step up and talk a little bit about Uwari since he's close to that. All right, for those that don't know me, I'm Bo, uh, membership of Southern Four Wheel Drive, president of Triad G Club in the uh, Uwari National Forest area. Uh, just a quick summary. Um, at the Uwari, there's a lot of things going on. The uh, Baden Lake Trail has kind of been put on hold with some uh, funding issues, funding questions as to uh, where the money's coming from to finish the trail. And last I heard it was surveyed out and marked. Um, so those flags have been pulled up pending um, finalization of the, the budget to build it. So it has not actually been started. Um, this year, we're having our big annual rendezvous next weekend. Um, the trail maintenance days have usually been run by uh, Friends of Uwari. Uh, and this year, we're working with the Forestry Service to train members of the clubs in the safety measures that the Forestry Service requires for what they want to see when the club goes out and does a uh, work day at the UR. So the clubs are going to take over the, the UR. Um, that's going to be the big push of the UR this year. It's a club takeover of the UR. We want the clubs to uh, adopt the UR and uh, adopt their trail in each club once a month, adopt a work day and post it um, with trained people that are trained in safety uh, per the forestry service. We have uh, been working to nail down the uh, forestry service on a date. Um, what day are they available to train us to do it their way? Um, and that's going to be a big thing that will uh, alleviate some things. Uh, with Tread Lightly, uh, North Carolina has the highest density of master tread trainers in the country. Um, so several clubs are coming on board with requiring Tread Lightly to the free online awareness course. Um, a lot of the clubs are coming online with requiring that of their members. If you want to be a member, you have to take the class uh, and prove it with your certificate. Um, and OEX offers a discount. A lot of the uh, area training offers discounts with that certificate. Uh, there is a new private uh, off-road park called Kingdom Jeeps that uh, their admission fee is pretty substantial unless you have that triad. The, uh, tread lightly certificate and then it's actually quite reasonable to go wheel that. Um, I taught the landowner he was in my tread trainer class that I hosted. So he is on board with uh, tread lightly. And of course this year we lost um, probably one of the biggest proponents out there. Uh, we lost Scott Fields to, to cancer. That was a uh, devastating uh, event at the UR. Um, for those that don't know, Southern Four Wheel Drive and Carolina Trailblazers um, purchased Scott's wife. It was originally Scott's wife, CJ, and Scott kind of took it over and uh, wheeled the CJ. Um, it was purchased by Carolina Trailblazers and Southern. Um, they fixed it up and they raffled it off. I know a lot of Southern members bought those raffle tickets. Um, a gentleman won it um, in the raffle. And he wasn't present, but uh, James Belcher spoke to him. And Scott's two children, uh, who were college age, took the Jeep on what they thought was their final ride. And uh, the gentleman gave them the Jeep back. So their mother's Jeep that their father, who had just lost, they got to keep it. Um, and all the proceeds went to them to help them pay for the college. Um, you know, Scott's big on education. So Losing him was a, a, a it was devastating. And, and he's got big shoes to fill down the UR. There's several people trying to step up, but you know, no one can do this guy. Yet. He's just got this. Um, that's kind of what's going on in the UR. Any, any questions about the UR? Thanks. As Bo said, uh, we lost a great one this summer with Scott. So. Next thing I want to go over to, next slide there, I'm going to get a moment uh, now. Uh, Beasley Knob, um, real quick, and I guess, uh, David, were you at work day? I was not. Okay. Um, just in general, as, as, just as 
as Triad and Bo were talking about clubs taking over uh, the Yorari National Forest in terms of the work days and the maintenance and so forth. GBR's been at Beasley Knob forever, you know. So they continued this year um, supporting Beasley Knob. Uh, they had, uh, that I'm aware of, both a March and an October work day up there. And cumulatively, they had well over 500 man hours uh, that they put in. And again, I go back, you know, that's the core of who we are. And as we go forward, that's, that's where we will build new users and, and new friends out there. Next slide. I um, want to go over just a couple real quick other land use items. Um, uh, some of this people may or may not be, uh, be aware. We also hold a seat on Region 8. Region 8 is the region in which our association resides for the National Forest Service. We, we have a seat on the Recreational Advisory Council. Uh, we had two meetings this year in June and October. Um, it was interesting in these meetings, um, there were basically a lot of funding issues going on, and they had more to do with, with cabins and lodges and really nothing to do with trail systems. Um, but one of, one of the things that, that I saw and, and expressed some real concern of in, in the course of those meetings is there's this tremendous unfunded liability sitting out there in our national parks and national uh, forest uh, where they have deferred maintenance and deferred maintenance cost and there's no funding on the other side of the ledger going forward to address those issues. So, you, you know, you, you, we all cringe at this, this thought of closing something, but we have a deteriorating system. It's really what it's boiling down to, with no funding. And, uh, you know, when we, when we brought that topic forward, you know, it's not a lot that the Forest Service could say or do, obviously, in that meeting, but, but personally, I was quite flabbergasted by the millions and millions and millions of dollars of unfunded liability that are sitting out there on the books. So as we go forward, you know, at least we got to keep pushing that, that we identify that we're spending the money in, in the best possible places. Um, next area, I'd like to ask Bob to stand up and give us a little bit of, bit of an update on the Tennessee Commissioner's Council. because I'm looking to you first. So, uh, this time of year, I've, I've been on this uh, council for nine years now, and uh, it's with the commissioner of the TDEC, and you have to understand when you get in the political process this time of year, it's who's in and who's out, and you, you change the governors, and so there's a lot more hype about that right now than there is in getting things done. There's a lot of planning stages, 10-year plans uh, in the state of Tennessee, even a 20-year plan. Talk about it. Uh, some of the positive things I'm going to bring up, uh, we do every two years biannual state trails form in Tennessee, which will be in April. Uh, I've twice done presentations here, and I'll be doing one in 2019 about economic impact. And uh, really, I focus on Ten events that go on in Tennessee, they're so far below the radar, nobody in the state government really understands them. Uh, and to name them real quick, Dixie Run Trail Fest, Chief Jamboree, two for Winrock, two for Brimstone, two for Rat Royal Blue. And one other one I'd throw in that happened a few years ago, uh, and I don't know how many of you remember that Chrysler, the chief, used to do a camp chief, starting from Collins, Colorado. Back to the West Coast. In 2008, uh, they decided not to do that anymore. But Polaris picked up this idea that they would do a camp razor and did it with side by sides. And just to show you numbers, and you know, I'm a Jeep person part, but when that event went on a few years ago, and they could pick anywhere in the country just like Jeep did, but they did pick Tennessee, and it happened to be in the Brimstone area. And they had approximately 15,000 show up on that three-day weekend. 
and you start again talking about gas, logic, the different things, and um, it makes a huge impact when you talk about numbers. Uh, and we get probably, I'm going to say Brent, 12 to 13,000 for the two events, which is somewhere close in that range. Uh, Brimstone's about the same, right royal blue. Uh, it's, it's smaller, but probably with their two, they'll get, I want to say around the 6,000 number, something like that, about, about three each, each time. But you start looking at the numbers and how they build up and how you can present those numbers. And, uh, and it's, it's huge, you know, you, you start talking about the events, uh, kind of just spike what's going on through the year. But uh, it, it'll be, you know, let's say an event produce about $3 million if, if you do methodology with, uh, like you're doing gas, logic, bills, little Walmart spending. Uh, but uh, to try to show that in this forum, you'll have most of the state park, the county parks, the, those type people from different parts of Tennessee show up. So, so again, it's a chance to show what can be done with trail systems. And uh, the other side of that, I'll, I'll get away from that since Roger's not here. You want me to say just a little bit about Colmont? Uh, yeah, we're going to go. Unless the, you've got somebody we're, covering that. We're going to go into Colmont. And you're more than welcome okay. to, when, now, we, when okay. we get there. Let me just leave that alone. Okay. But uh, again, political change. Uh, we've got a meeting uh, on the 13th of December that I'm sure there'll be some updates on who's out, who's in, and plans that we go forward. I am going to mention on that same council, I've been there nine years, but Dave Halstead is, is also serving in that now, representing, and it's user groups. There's 15 of us, and we both represent off-highway vehicles. There'll be equestrian people, hiking people, mountain bike people, the different ones that are on there. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, there's nothing concrete to say, hey, yeah, this is going to happen tomorrow, but it's, it's a process that you continue to... to beat on and I will talk about what y'all are doing. You talk about successes other places and, and again why we're not doing it in Tennessee and it just gives you more opportunity to present that. Thanks Bob. We've, uh, we've also been involved uh, as a follow up to that in the, in the Georgia <clears throat> region in their recreational trail program for years. Dave, Dave served in that role for many years. Ken Sutz is currently doing that. And they, they continue to do their work as well. Um, one of the things that they're currently doing right now is they're developing a two-year plan versus their traditional one-year plan. And in 2018, uh, there was approximately $2 million in RTP funds uh, authorized for motorized projects. What I don't have is the details on what those specific projects were. Uh, but at least the funding part of which, as we know, when you work, as Bob just says, you work through these processes, uh, the funding element becomes the, one of the first pieces you have to have in place. Um, another one that, that you'll hear a little bit more of as we go through this morning, um, Flint Holbrook and myself um, and Robert have been, I'll call it monitoring, a group out there, a national group called the Coalition for Recreational Trails, and they are, they are a part of American Trails. And, um, and you'll see in a while when we present more on that, but um, very interestingly, they primarily are hikers, bikers type users, but they have now invited um, Southern Four-Wheel Drive Association, Cal 4x4, and Orba to attend a motorized symposium in April of next spring in Syracuse, New York. And so they are, they are beginning um, to do an outreach to try to bring the motorized component into this broader national federation that they're building. And I, as I, I shared with Dave this morning, I think it gives us a real opportunity to have a voice, again, on a national stage, a much bigger picture than what we traditionally deal with on a regional basis. Next slide. Clip. 
Um, before I go into NAMRAC, um, I'd like to introduce the Appalachian Toyota Roundup Brett. Um, Brett's with us today. Uh, they've been extremely supportive of Southern over the last several years. The floor is yours, Brett. All right. Brett, will you talk from up here? The people online are sure. having trouble All right. hearing from here. We can do that. Maybe that will improve things a little bit more. We've got about 15 people watching this from wherever. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Brett. I'm the founder and organizer of the Appalachian Toyota Roundup. It's uh, held every Labor Day weekend. Um, Windrock Park, Mr. Brent over there. Um, Windrock's been a huge part of this event, and uh, we're going to come in and uh, <coughs> found a need on the East Coast for a Toyota event. They uh, pretty much support that on the West Coast side. We didn't have anything that we could grab to, to on the East Coast, so we kind of merged this uh, about five years ago and been doing well with the support of Windrock and a lot of other organizations and stuff here in the southeast including the southern four-wheel drive association and this event has grown larger than we ever ever intended uh, we had uh, 637 vehicles at the event last year it goes uh, every single labor day um, starts the thursday before ends actually on labor day weekend it's a three-day event four nights and uh, what we did this year and we do every year is we pick an off-road foundation that we make a charity benefactor from the event. The event is set up, it's a nonprofit event, and what we try to do is support the organizations that are supporting us, not just in the Southeast, though primarily. And uh, every year we try to take care of you guys for everything you do. And uh, this year we wanted to present you guys with a thousand dollar check and uh, say thank you for what you Thank you. <laughs> it's really great to see you. so many things happening and so many positive things. It's outstanding. Thanks, Brett. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I've attended the NAMRAC, the North American Motorized Recreation Council meeting, the last several years um, out in Las Vegas. And they, they coordinate it with SEMA. Um, this was actually the 22nd year for NAMRAC meeting and again Dave did it for years and uh, you look around the room and there's a lot of gray hair okay there's not a lot of young faces that are out there uh, on this land use uh, direction strategy model and how to engage things like that um, one of the things that that has really been somewhat eye-opening over the last couple years is Steve Egbert, which is the president of Cal 4x4, and myself have become much more visible and much more vocal in those meetings, and, and quite frankly, trying to challenge some of the thought processes. And, 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 and one, of the, one of the things that you come up with in these national forums is that <coughs> what works on BLM lands doesn't have any application to what we're trying to do here in the Southeast. And, and it's important, I believe, on a national level for them to understand that and why and how it works. And I think we're, we're making inroads there, but it's a, it's a slow, slow process. Um, then, uh, we're getting a coal mine, Bob. Um, Obviously, Roger could not be with us. Um, again, talking about processes, you know, this, this, they purchased that land, uh, a little over 1,300 acres in 2017, as you see here. Um, they have continued to work through the process in working with the state of Tennessee. Um, they've, they now have the, uh, the approval on the construction RTP grant, okay, finally. And so the steps where they, where they are right now is the mayor of Colmont has signed the contract, okay, the, the RTP grant contract. Um, and we're, we're basically saying today what we said a year ago, effectively, because we've had to walk through and create a, an off-road committee that's a, a part of the city council in, in the city of Colmont. Um, we have two southern representatives on that, on that committee. 
And what they're looking at right now is that hopefully in January, they will start the survey and engineering, uh, which will include everything from topo and trail maps and layouts and so forth and design. Um, then, then they'll move into hopefully the beginning of some construction in in the spring. Yeah, John. Yeah. I got a question on this, and maybe you guys can touch on this a little bit. I remember a uh, cold winter day, probably about six years ago. We were sitting down in that area, and a young mayor, probably. 20 years old uh, came up and started talking to us about that this whole area and like you said it's been a really long process going into this and uh, it, as far as that process goes and the money Tennessee is wanting to put into here the, the land and the community where are we at on that is it well the lands purchased okay that was one RTP grant okay the, for the purchase of the 1300 acres. Then there was a second RTP grant, okay, for construction. And that's the one that's gone back and forth like a volleyball. And, and like I think uh, Bob mentioned about political change and elections and things like that. That young mayor, by the way, is no longer around, okay. And you have, you have you're, you're dealing with a poor community, fundamentally. And so you've got local vo uh, volunteers that are the mayor and the clerks and so forth. And they're engaging in this, but, but my assessment is they really want that, off that OHV committee to be the manager of the project. Um, one of the members, and I'm going to get the name wrong, the retired gentleman that was with TDEC, um, Bob Richards, yeah, Bob Richards, which is now living, I believe, in the Knoxville area somewhere, um, is also a member of that OHV committee, and, and quite frankly, a, a really strong connection point, you know, on this whole project. So, where we are is it's taken a year plus to go through the political process to get to the point where we can actually do something on the ground, and and hopefully we are there. Um, you'll see here. And, and you, you might recall from some previous conversations over the years that we were talking at one point that our commitment as an, as an association was in the $100,000 type range. As this thing's progressed through, right now we're committed to a $47,000 contribution, and that's largely in volunteer efforts and feet on the ground, okay, which obviously we've all done over the years. One of the things that the construction grant does not pay for is the building of a pavilion, okay, as they lay out the entry and the master plan of that. Uh, the Toyota Land Cruiser Group, they actually have stepped up and are going to be purchasing and erecting that pavilion out of their association funds. And so I, I look forward, I'm sure in, in 2019, somewhere along the way, um, they'll be coming our way, you know, as part of our grant program. So it looks, John, to answer, I think they're finally moving along where the pieces are right, okay? Hopefully we get on the ground this year. It's awesome. I can't wait to ride it. Great area. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. Okay, next slide. This is when we want to go over to Mr. Gallagher. This might take a minute. Yeah, Brent, Brent's got his own little PowerPoint that we'll, we'll let him share. That's what, right? Yeah. He gave that to me this morning. That's a piece of history. It is. I was, uh, my name's Brent Galloway. I'm the general manager of One Rock Park. I've been a member of Southern Foil Drive since, uh, well, since I was 16, and I'm 44, so you can do the math on whatever that is, but <laughs> Tennessee Valley Four Wheelers was my, that's where I started. In fact, my dad had to join because they didn't allow people that were under 18 
So my dad joined, so my family was a member. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's pretty neat. You're controlling the clicker? Well, it'll work now. Anyway. It's just right broken. All right. It's all right. <laughs> well, they asked, uh, they asked if I would give a short presentation on One Drop Park. Uh, I'd say most of you probably know about it. Most of you have probably been there, but maybe some haven't. Maybe some haven't been there in quite some time. So I'll update you on some of the things we have going on. Uh, some of the, the, the brief things are uh, that we have three, thir uh, 73,000 acres, over 3,000. That didn't come out right at all. <laughs> Take a deep breath. We used to have about 72,000 acres. We, in the past year, we purchased another, it was almost 1,000 acres that borders us. Um, it's not part of the trail system yet, but at some point there will probably be some additional things there. Um, we have over 300 miles of trails uh, of, all, of all difficulties, easy, moderate, extreme, um, for all different types of vehicle. Um, we do have, uh, and this, this topic comes up quite a bit, uh, we do have a no alcohol policy on our trails. Uh, we've actually always had that policy. Uh, but in the last three or four years, we have really started enforcing it, and our accident rate has gone down significantly. Uh, we have found that we have lost some business by those that <coughs> insist that they have to drink while they ride. Um, but what we've found is that we get, we're get we getting more and more business from family members or families that want to come and ride and not have to get worried about Running over on a, uh, running over by a razor, running 60 miles an hour because they were drunk. Um, so it's it's working out well for us. Uh, we s certainly uh, alcohol is still alive in campground within you know reasonable consumption and all that. But we've uh, on the trail system it is not. Whoa, we can do well now, right? Huh? Let's just go on through this. There is a forward and a backward button, and yes, both so. made it go forward. So, all right, <laughs> start again. Yeah, it's technology. Uh, we do have a general store that is is by our trail uh, main trailhead. Has fuel sales. Uh, uh, rental machines are there. T-shirts, hats, other souvenirs. Uh, the Windrock Grill uh, is not owned by us. Uh, we lease uh, that to the gentleman that runs it. Uh, they have, they're open Friday through Sunday. It's actually quite good food, uh, recommend it. Uh, we do have a, a rental machine fleet of about 11, and it depends on if one's been wrecked or not, anywhere between nine and 12 rental machines. Uh, most are Yamahas, uh, we do have uh, a couple of Hondas uh, in within Windrock Park, we have we now have the Windrock Bike Park, uh, which is a downhill mountain bike uh, park that is. I, think I see Dave sticking his thumb up. Uh, Dave's son rides there. Um, if you think you're tough in a Jeep, you can do some awesome things. Get on a downhill mountain bike and come down the mountain. It's a whole different. Uh, <laughs> I don't do that. Uh, they had, it started out as, as uh, extremely difficult trails, um, and, and we have leased the area to a professional mountain biker. Uh, like he's a pro rider, well known within, uh, within around the country. Uh, he and another guy run the park, uh, and on Saturday and Sunday they have a shuttle that takes you to the top of the mountain. And you can ride down. Uh, the rest of the time it's self shuttle. They have built some easy, easier trails and are continuing to improve the park. And uh, we are getting more and more business from from mountain bikers, which I think, you know, we're 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 trying to produce the we're, we're trying to produce the uh, a, a an overall destination for off road recreation, whether it's motorized or non motorized. Uh, yes, Dave. I, I I just want to add because I know a lot of you guys want to can't say enough about what that's going to do economically for Tennessee. You have some of the world's best riders in Tennessee, believe it or not. At least my son's ranked number 12. 
Nico, of course, and I think four or five go to Norton. But just a funny story, they were riding a couple weeks ago over there with some guys from Whistler. Whistler's where some of the World Cups are held. And those guys got to the top of horse face and they went, y'all are nuts, we're not riding this. It's some, it, it, if you're ever, uh, there's a, uh, a race in March called Pro Gravity Tour. Uh, if you're ever around in March, if you're riding and you want to just take a, and watch, it's impressive. Uh, I mean, the, the guys and gals that do this, they're, they're nuts. I mean, that's, that's all I can say. Uh, but it is becoming a, a more valuable part of our business, and it's, it's diversifying who comes to the park. Um, and, and their dollars spend just as well as, as other dollars. Uh, we have, uh, as part of the park, we have Windrock Shooting Range. There again, it, it is actually a leased business. It's on the property, but we lease it to somebody. Uh, he runs it. Uh, it's open six days a week. It's closed on Wednesdays. Uh, you can rent. You can bring your own weapons, uh, but you can also rent fully automatic uh, weapons. You can rent the, the 50 caliber. Um, that is Samantha Collins, our marketing manager, uh, shooting the 50 cal. This, this uh, is painful. Go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> But if you've never shot a fully automatic weapon, I highly recommend it. I, I hadn't until here, and it's, I had a grin from ear to ear. Uh, I bet Samantha did. Oh, she did. Oh, not after that. That was not fully automatic. Uh, our campground is 250 acres, currently has 25 uh, fully furnished cabins, 39 RV sites, over 100, 100 perimeter camping, two bathhouses, pavilion, campground, etc. Uh, what we're currently working on to update the campground is we currently have five more cabins under construction on Windrock Road. Uh, there will be, th currently there's four that are under construction that are one bedroom, one bath, uh, and then there is going to be another two bedroom, two story, two bathroom. Uh, so that will give us a total of 30 cabins. Uh, if you've ever stayed in our cabins, uh, they're not portable buildings that we brought in and that were supposed to be sheds that we've just put beds in and air conditionings and called them cabins. Um, they're nice, uh, they're nice stick built, uh, nicely furnished cabins. Um, we are considering uh, adding more RV sites. We're looking into that as far as uh, the infrastructure. We just got approved. There have been some sewer issues within the city of Oliver Springs. Um, and so the state put a moratorium on new sewer taps, but uh, just this week I got approval for uh, to add 15 sewer taps. Uh, and so I'm going to try to try to come up with a place that we can add 15 uh, our full hookup RV sites. Uh, we are also looking at adding two yurts this year, uh, which if you don't know what a yurt is, it's a big permanent fancy tent essentially um, for those that want to come camping. Uh, but they don't like it when it rains and all the crap gets wet. Uh, they don't want to be able to, they want a door that locks uh, or whatever. Um, we're, we're looking at putting in a couple of yurts just for something something different this year. Uh, the biggest thing that is uh, noteworthy that as of today, you can now make your campground reservations online. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Um, it was a lot of it was way more difficult than what it should have been. Uh, when you're a hotel and you have three room styles, it's pretty easy, but when you have uh, 25 different cabins, you have RV sites, you have, uh, or full hookup RV sites, you have RV sites that are not full hookup, you have primitive, you have all these different things. It was very, very difficult to get this put together. And uh, it is, I don't know how it's going today, I'm afraid to call and see, but it, you can still call and make your reservation, but you can now uh, book online. Windrock Hollow is, a, is our newer event area. Uh, we have two areas. Uh, one is outside of the campground, which is called the group camping area. Uh, it used to be our event area, uh, but, but some of the events outgrew that, so we, we built an area called Windrock Hollow. Uh, a few years ago, it has a pavilion, it has lights, PA system, that kind of stuff. 
but we, uh, we, we started running out of parking on large events. Uh, so uh, this past year, we, can you start that video out? I'm not sure it's asking for a lot of it is. This was a short video we put together. We had a concert this past year, um, and we had new parking, and this was a short, about a one minute video. Uh, this is actually Windrock Hollow here, and this is this is parking. This is, well, that's actually a residence. This is 13 acres of new parking that we built uh, this past year. It's all gravel. Um, it will be, it can be used for large events such as our, our concerts, uh, which draw somewhere between three and 5,000 people. Um, and a lot of those all come in vehicles from, from Knoxville and surrounding communities. Uh, but it can also be used for, for large events if, if we needed a group area where, uh, where you wanted everybody together camping and, and RVs and there wouldn't be any hookups, but but it could be used basically like a field, except for instead of being a field, it's gravel. Uh, so it would be even better if it's in, if it's raining. Uh, Rock Hollow does have, a, I think I already mentioned that, pavilion, lighting, et cetera. Trail maintenance. Uh, in 2009, uh, we are going to focus mainly on sedimentation control and maintenance of some of our main artery moderate level trails. Um, we made an adjustment to the way that we, we, have, we did our, our, our trail maintenance in-house and then for a couple of years we tried to use contractors to do that. Um, and to be quite frank, contractors just didn't work. Um, it was too difficult trying to, uh, to coordinate with them and they were insistent on working even if the weather wasn't good because they're not making money unless their machine's making money. Um, and so we've backed up and said that didn't work and so we, uh, we're going to be start doing it in-house again. Uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, we will take delivery of our, we, we ordered a brand new uh, larger bulldozer uh, that will be hopefully more efficient than the one we have now. Um, we're also going, in the next year, we're going to be buying a, a transport truck like the Division of Forestry uses to transport their fire plows, uh, something, is that for me? <laughs> uh, that it's a truck that transports the machinery instead of being, right now we use a single axle dump truck and a tag along trailer. Well, as soon as the road gets rough at all, we have, we have to park and then tram the machines. Uh, the transport trucks, they're not off-road vehicles, but they do well uh, just on rough gravel roads and, th and things like that. So it should improve the, the wear and tear on the dozer, uh, but it will also improve the efficiency and just the time of getting the machine where we need to use it. This is uh, the current events we have scheduled for 2019 uh, so far. Uh, we've got the Southern Rock, uh, Southern Rock Racing Series, uh, Pro Gravity Tour, Titan Off-Road, Shamrock Shakedown, Dirty Ice Riders Club Ride, not sure who they are, Jeep Jamboree USA, Four of Them for a Cure, Spring Shindig, Smoky Mountain, Great Smoky Mountain Trail Ride, Race to Riches, Hill Climb, Appalachian Toyota Roundup, Went Windrock, Florida Trail Stompers Club Ride, Windrock, Fall Jam Windrock Park Fall Jamboree, and the Bigfoot Blast 5 and 10K, which is a, a uh, trail running race that we do, which is a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club of Anderson County. This year, uh, we, I'm sorry, 18, in 2018, we started something called the Shindig, uh, which involves music. Um, it's, it's part of our jam fall, spring and fall jamboree, but uh, we had, this year we had uh, Michael Ray and John Hardy uh, as, as artists, and this year uh, there will be another, there will be other large artists, I can't, I'm not at liberty to say who they are yet, uh, but there will be one in April, and we're going to do our first one in July. 
Uh, and that brings a huge crowd to the park. <coughs> One that you're probably more, con more interested in, we are in negotiations uh, with a promoter that is, does some other events, uh, and I can't give a lot of details about that, but it will be an off-road endurance race. Um, the goal is that the West Coast has King of the Hammers, the East Coast needs something, just not just like it, but something that is, is world-renowned. Um, and so the initial talks of that can come. I think it, if, if things go as planned, I think it will be something that's very exciting. It will be good. If you want to compete, it would be great, but it would also be good from a spectator standpoint and, and uh, be very good for, for the sport. In 2019, hopefully by April, uh, we will have uh, the new Windrock Park app available, um, be downloadable to cell phones, uh, to smartphones and apps, sorry, smartphones and tablets. Um, it will be both available on Android and iPhones. Um, it'll have campground information, permit information, event information, but what is most noteworthy is that it will also have a downloadable electronic trail map. Um, we have talked to Cargo Tracks and we've talked to some other companies um, and we've decided on, on a version that will be, basically it will look just like our trail map. Whatever our current paper trail map is, it will basically look just like that. It will be geo-referenced, so as you're riding around uh, on the property, the little blue dot will show you exactly where you are. It will work where cell phone, you don't have to have cell phone service. Um, it will, there will be a lifespan, and I think currently it'll be, you can either purchase seven days or 365 days. Cost will be nominal, uh, probably a, a week will be somewhere six or seven, eight dollars. A year will probably be 15 or 20, something like that. More expensive than a paper ma trail map, but costs a lot more to develop. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of riders that buy a map that they don't have a clue how to read. <laughs> so this, this hopefully will be, be a great benefit. I will leave you with one last video. We do some, we have been doing a lot of uh, marketing uh, online and in different places. Um, and since this was a video from last Christmas, and since we're in the Christmas season now, I'll leave you with this.
We'll move along and just uh, start to touch on a few other uh, uh, parks that are out there. And Pete, I want to ask you, you're probably the one closest to Adventure Off-Road. Sort of give us an update. Obviously, we're all familiar with change in ownership uh, there at uh, AOP. Go up here, Pete. Oh, wow. Yeah, be a star. <laughs> you, you know you like the bright lights. I know. Um, so at AOP, um, Sean, the baseball player, is taking over. Um, it's it's a learning experience. Uh, he's trying to figure things out. Uh, it's business as usual. We're doing a lot of trail maintenance. Um, if anybody who's been there recently, you'll notice um, there's been a lot of gravel put down. Um, I mean, it's just he's trying to figure things out, and he's taking everything into account. Um, I look for a lot of great things come this year um, for. 2019. But uh, other than that, it's just business as usual. Come out, check everything out. If you guys got questions or concerns, uh, you know, let uh, Karen's in the office there, or Benji, or myself, or get with Sean. Um, you know, he's open to ideas and, you know, anything we can do to make the park better. Thank you. Oh. Seems like I saw some photos looks like it's the park expansion. Yes, um, so uh, we bought 100 acres, um, and it's, in my opinion, it's going to be some of the best riding on the park. Um, it will provide a new access point to the trails, um, so it will alleviate some of the pressure on Trail 1. Um, we're currently cutting trails right now, if anybody wants to come out. Uh, just about every weekend, there's a tree cutting party. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's going to be some of the some of the best riding uh, to me on the park. A lot of green trails, some blues. While you're up here, Pete, we'll jump, <clears throat> jump ahead a little bit. Hawk Pride, because I know you 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 were just there. A little update on the state of Hawk Pride. You're good. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about AOP real quick, and I know Ray, I've slightly talked to you about this, but as far as the camping goes and everything there, um, getting cooked in that field. Um, it's a little rough every once in a while. And one thing I've suggested and something we could explore a little bit, maybe Southern could get involved in, is uh, planting some trees in that field. Uh, we've uh, discussed some of that. Um, I don't know if you're uh, familiar where they put the new um, pole barn. Um, it's over by the uh, shower trailer. Mm -hmm. They've opened that area up over there for camping. Uh, there's a lot of good shade over there. <coughs> So yeah, I mean they're they're working, trying to figure things out. Um, I would say I would say this year's going to be a good year as far as changes. So. Yeah, Christina. What about in terms of uh, kind of updating the actual trail from the map? Yeah. Um, currently talking with uh, Jake at Cardo Tracks. Um, hopefully we can make that a reality. Um, it's just kind of we're in the uh, initial process of it. So hopefully we'll have a digital map. Uh, we've started putting up new signs, uh, replacing some of the old ones. So make it a little easier for people. Our, our experience with, uh, with Jake uh, and, and Cardo Tracks is that if, if you go out and create the, the GPS locations, you do all the, the tracking and then feed those into him, he can create the map for you and you reduce a lot of cost other than them actually coming out and running all the tracks themselves. Yeah. Got to coordinate to make right. sure that you're collecting in the right format that he needs, but you can reduce the cost of your project a lot if you collect the GPS data and feed it up to him and Jennifer. Okay. So Hawk Pride, uh, <coughs> as you know, we've decided to go Trail Fest at Hawk Pride. 
Um, Do you want to talk about the schedule? We'll get into the schedule a little bit later. But. Uh, basically, uh, Mark out there, I'm a super great guy. Um, he seems to be on board completely anything that Southern wants to do. Um, he wants to get in uh, promoting some of the educational courses that we offer. Um, he's just, he's kind of, it's kind of a rarity. I mean, really, he, um, he's always adding to the park. Um, he's putting in uh, a lot of gravel areas for parking. Um, they had RVD this past weekend. Um, I think they had over 5,000 people uh, <coughs> at one point or another for the weekend. Um, it's just, you know, the park to me, it, you know, I've been there three times and it, it is definitely my favorite park. It's, it's just, um, it's all constantly growing. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing, we'll jump ahead to Trail Fest, but one of the things that Mark is allowing us to do also is all of the reservations for cabins and RV spots, okay, are actually going to be coming through Southern, okay? So that way we can manage that when we get into the into the the event side. Big Creek, um, <coughs> really not much change. No, there's uh, Mike's going to have uh, Triad come out and uh, widen a few of the trails in certain areas um, to accommodate uh, a lot of the bigger vehicles going through the your Toyotas, your four door JKUs, some of the new four door JLs. Uh, they found some of those uh, trails to be a little bit snug. They were narrow from the beginning. Even in a two door, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so uh, he's working on uh, selecting certain areas to, to widen them up a bit. But other than that, it's business as usual over Big Creek. Um, a couple other real quick updates, and I don't know of any current news. Uh, I think most of us know that uh, Busted Knuckle was put on the market earlier this summer. Um, it sold. It did sell. Yeah, it'll, it's no more. As a park gone. Yeah, it's okay. uh, on the property now. So you cross that one off. Okay. <laughs> Golden Mountain, um, as you know, we held our last Dixie run there at Golden Mountain. It was sort of a sort of a sad event from that break because I think many of us had a lot of great times at Golden Mountain. Um, speaking with Jane here recently, uh, really no move. Um, it, it, it's technically not even listed yet for sale, although it's verbally for sale. Uh, the hang up is right now surveying it and determining what she's going to sell and what she's going to keep. Hawk Pride, I had Pete touch on. <coughs> Another one that we, uh, we we keep plugged in with is Black Mountain. <laughs> uh, I think a number of us. <coughs> Just there on Labor Day week. Perfect. Give so, us an update. Sure. Um, Black Mountain, not a whole lot has changed there over the years. It's been there, it's sort of the same um, trail system. Um, I've heard through the grapevine, I haven't seen it yet. They were supposed to get another additional 7,000 acres to develop. Um, I know they really are focusing on their camping area, getting more cabins over there. Um, I know they've got like a, uh, I think it's a five bedroom cabin <coughs> that's gonna open next spring for riders. That's about where they're at right now. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. One, as we move through this the conservation area, one thing I want to touch on briefly, you know, over the years, we've had a num number of engagements with some uh, groups out there. And we want to give a little bit of an <coughs> overview, and primarily the four that we have uh, been engaged with for an extended period of time are Blue Ribbon Coalition, Tread Lightly, uh, Orba and the United Four Wheel Drive Association. Um, any of y'all that followed this on social media, you probably saw earlier this year there was a change of leadership at Blue Ribbon Coalition. There's a new executive director, his name's Spencer Gilbert, and there's a number of us in the off road community or, or the motorized community that are not real clear on what the direction of Blue Ribbon is. Uh, they, they reduce their staff and overhead costs substantially. Um, at the same time, a uh, gentleman like all of us knew Todd Ocker, he, he's no longer associated with them. Dale Albright's no longer associated with them. And, and when they shared some of the strategy documents at the NAMRAC meeting, 
Um, basically, what I got out of it is that that they're very Western oriented, and I don't see uh, as we go forward the outreach to us in the East, the South, other parts of the country. And I think it maybe limited assets that they have to work with. Uh, they, they are in the process of forming a new 501c4 under, the, under the, the definition they want to become more active in the lobbying and uh, the ability to create and direct legislation. Um, I, see a, a, I see a lot of overlap between what they're saying and what Orb is trying to do. And, and I'm not quite I personally am not quite sure where that fits going forward, and we'll talk about that when we get into the area of uh, our funding for 2019. <laughs> Tread lightly, I'd really like Al. Al's probably got the closest relationship with Danielle and Tread Lightly, just to give us a quick snapshot of what's going on with Tread Lightly. Well, I'll be glad to. Southern has done a good job uh, of giving me the facilities to, to represent Tread Lightly here on the, in the southeast. Uh, we've done lots of training. Just a little while ago, Bo mentioned that he's trained seven Tread Lightly instructors, uh, mostly in upstate South Carolina, where they are, uh, and we're going to be training more. We've reached, uh, for a total of 291 people, we've taught formal Tread Lightly training to this year. Bo's help with that, Gary's help with that, a lot of people's help. So, um, so we're doing good there. And we're getting on the map with Tread Lightly. That's, I think that's important. Danielle looks at us as a, as a very supportive organization of Tread Lightly. Uh, we're trying to get her out here a time or two this, year, this coming year to some of our events. Um, we just, as soon as we nail down the schedule, we'll determine if she can do that or not. Uh, we, as a Southern organization, donate, what, $1,000? every year to tread lightly to help them keep going. And one of the things they're really trying to do now is they realize the, the East Coast uh, is different from the West Coast, and they're trying to put a representative from tread lightly here on the East Coast to help us. Scott Fields was, uh, was very instrumental in getting that ball rolling, and we're trying to keep that ball rolling. So hopefully this year, maybe this year, we'll get someone named that will be a tread lightly employee, but they're ash also ash. They're also asking the National Forest Service to pay a little bit of that person's salary. So that's what's slowing that down a little bit. But, uh, American um, Jeep Club had a train class. We had two train classes at Uhari. Uh, we did four train classes at Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion this, this past summer. Uh, we mentioned the Tread Trainer class that Bo did. Uh, and one of my buddies, Lady Eddie Schrader, we got him certified as an instructor, and he got the privilege to go teach Tread Lightly to the Ladies Off Road Network. Now, it's he volunteered to go teach the ladies. <laughs> Bo and I did. <laughs> <laughs> but that was good. There was 21 people attended that. 21 ladies from the uh, upstate of South Carolina attended that training. Now, might not be the right time, but you guys need to find opportunities to invite me or Bo or any of the other Trail Lightly trainers in to your organization to, to do a training class. Let's teach folks the principles of Trail Lightly. And everything we say here today is let's keep our trails open, keep our trails open. One way to do that is education. Education. And I hope we get to move forward this year with that. You got it. Sorry. A little long yeah. ago. How, yes. How long does it how long does it take to go through one of those training sessions? We've got, uh, we've, there's several different levels. We can do awareness training, which is what we do just to tell you about the trail out of the principles. That's about an hour, hour and a half. We can do a three hour training class and we go anywhere from a three hour to, how long did your class last both for the trainers? It was a full day, right? Well, it's a, yeah, it's a full day. So to become a trainer, it's a pretty much all day thing. But we can tailor another training class to whatever your, whatever you can stomach. 
If you can take an hour, we'll do an hour. If you can give me three hours, we just go into a lot more detail. So if we wanted to bring you up with our club to Slade, yes, or one of you, yeah, yep. schedule a two-day ride and do training on Saturday and ride on Sunday. Oh, we'd love to do that. Let's or, do it. Or train on Friday and ride on Saturday. Yeah. yeah depending on schedule. people's availability and schedule. We can do, you know, half hour before training or before ride, you know, tailored to whatever you want, like we do for events. I, I think our, our club is, as a group, is very aware of Tread Lightly. We pound it every single meeting, every single ride. But I think it would be a good badge for us to have as a club to have the majority of our members certified and... Well, I really like that idea that Bo shared earlier on about the clubs over in North Carolina that are requiring the online Tread Lightly awareness class, okay, as part of their membership. I mean, that's a, that's a great first step. It, it's a half hour, 45 minute on the internet, on your lunch break, and it's really important. Let's talk more about that. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Again, I think everyone's getting the gist of where where we're going and where we're thinking. Uh, the value of, of what we're doing in terms of the conservation and land use issues, and it leads right into what Al's talking about on the educational component. A, a group that's been around for a long time, and, and we over the years we've seen a lot of changes in the United Four Wheel Drive Association. And I'll, I'll just use the term effectively. It went dormant. I think it's a fair description of it a few years ago. Um, there's a concerted effort, um, basically largely being driven by Fred Wiley at Orba, uh, to try to rebrand, reinvigorate United, because it is a recognizable name and, and uh, logo, and it's got some brand value. And it's taken us some time, but we have slowly started to, I'll call, infiltrate the board of directors, okay, of United. And as you can see in the uh, most recent elections, um, Steve Egbert, which is the president of Cal 4x4, has taken on the role of president of United Four Wheel Drive Association. I've stepped up as the vice president, and Fred Wiley from Orba has stepped up as the treasurer. Um, one critical element in that is that we have formalized an agreement, an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, between Orba and United. And, and fundamentally, going forward, you're going to see a lot of activities that are coming out of Orba that will have some United branding on it. We're trying to link the two so that we can start to rebuild the recognition of, of United. So we look at that as a long-term project, but that's, that's something that is ongoing. David? You just briefly touch on one voice to show how Orba and United come together to create Yeah, and, and yeah, really the, the pivotal, and we've talked about this in previous annual meetings, really the pivotal thing coming out of, out of Orba, which is the <coughs> Off-Road Business Association, is one voice. And, and the concept is that we as users and, and the vendors that support this industry all come together, you know, as one voice, and, and then we're able to build and communicate, okay, across the industry. Um, the number of major companies, include, including Omics Ada and BFG and so forth, have all become major uh, drivers uh, behind the Orba model. And as you will recall, I'm going to say three years ago, we as Southern engaged with Orba right away to try to become part of that one voice as we build this nationally. That's where United comes in because they then become, again, another part of this national building so that we have a consistent message. Because that's one of the things I hear in a lot of these meetings is some inconsistencies of approach and message from west to east. This way, we can, we are, we're on, the, on a common platform. Okay. Many of you know, uh, and I got to thank Flint and my wife. Um, we won it for the fifth year in a row. I think it's pretty outstanding that a Southern member is the uh, United Four Wheeler of the Year for the, for the fifth year in a row. That's uh, pretty awesome as we as we go forward. And I thank each one of you guys.
Who was that person that won? Me. <laughs> <laughs> And we really just touched on this. This is, in essence, you know, the the, uh, the agenda of Orba that obviously we totally subscribe to and support. At this point, I would like to take a ten-minute break. Okay. The uh, the next part we want to start to move into is to give give and share with everyone a financial overview of our association for 2018. Wherever Doyle is, I want him to be close by. There he is. But that's briefly the agenda that we're going to try to run through here and, uh, and move on with some uh, details. As I, one of the reasons I wanted to share from the beginning today the land use and specifically the activity at the Daniel Boone is obviously the financial impact that it has on us as an association. Overall, we have had a good year, but you can see the impact first and foremost on our balance sheet on the top line. Um, about what we expected, okay, you know, based on all the activity that, that has gone on at the Daniel Bloom Backcountry Byway, but uh, it does definitely show up in our in our financial results. Oops. That's quick. Try that. See if you do live on Facebook. It says low battery. Uh oh. Okay. That's <laughs> going. That's going to be a killer. In in 2018, um, this was the budget that we had uh, proposed and was approved at the meeting last year. Um, this is this is the actual results on a year over year basis of our budget versus actual numbers. You can tell we missed, and you'll see this in, in the event uh, participation of both Trail Fest and Dixie Run in a moment. Uh, we missed our top line um, by about $15,000, which effectively, as you will see, almost matches the number um, of what's coming up as a shortfall on the bottom line. Uh, but obviously, our largest expense right there is in our grant program, and of which that is the, the legal fund funds that we used at the Daniel Boone this year. Give you a quick uh, snapshot of Trail Fest, um, and anyone's more than welcome to offer any comments or inputs. But this is actually what the numbers look like for 2018. Dixie Run, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, we uh, we celebrated Dixie Run 32 at Golden Mountain Park in Sparta, Tennessee. Um, last one there at uh, at Golden Mountain. Numbers were down for Dixie Run this year, and I think a lot of that in the feedback and assessments that that I got was um, we were down about 12 percent on total attendance, and. Uh, we did a really good job on the expense side of managing the event, um, even though the top line was a little lower than, than what we had budgeted uh, versus the previous year. Uh, our top line, believe it or not, was down roughly 24% because of the lower attendance number. And I think I'll, in, in, in looking at that, we really believe that a lot of it was, I'm going to call it the mixed messages that were coming out of Golden Mountain Park leading up to up to Dixie Run. This is a chart many of y'all seen before that I keep tracking year over year, just sort of the, the historical patterns of Dixie Run. And uh, you know, you, even though we're talking about a, a, what I consider a soft year, um, we're still when you look back in here, okay, we're still measuring quite well. The big spike. If anybody remembers, that was 2016 and 30, which was a huge event for, for our association. This is a uh, snapshot for you real quick of, of all the various grant uh, 
projects that went on in 2018. And as you saw on the earlier financial slide, um, our total grants for the year were a little over $76,000, of which obviously 56,000 of it was in the legal fund area. John? No mic, so I'll just go from here. Okay. Um, can you tell everybody how this stacks up to like the BFG uh, trail wars and everything else where we're at country-wise? I was actually just discussing this with somebody. Do you know where the numbers are? I compared to BFG, but I'm going to show you a number that's really interesting in a moment. And I think a lot of people and our members that support what we're doing at Southern don't know this. But, you know, I think obviously that's a really aggressive year for our association, you know, relative to, to our uh, balance sheet. Um, I'm also going to share with you real quick what happened in 2017. There was roughly $40,000 in 17. One of the things that I wanted to share as well, um, you remember in 2017 that we filed for trademark protection, okay, of the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association logo and, and uh, conservation, recreation, and education. Uh, we also filed for trademark protection for the name Dixie Run and the name Trail Fest. We've now been awarded by the, by the Patent Office and the federal government official trademark designations for those. So I think that's a real strong position for us. Back in one of the earlier years of the grant program, John, this is where we're going, there was another $33,000. But that's what the grant program looks like over a three-year period. So we as an association have put back $150,000 into our community from the resources and the efforts of, of all of us. And I think, I think that's a remarkable number <coughs> that, that we all need to be very proud of in terms of communicating with the community. My point on that was we did a little bit of uh, Google research. This is not official research, but as of right now, Southern Four Wheel Drive is putting more money back into the community than most places. It, it's pretty amazing what we're doing. We're really at the spearhead of this, if, if you look at it overall. And, and I, as I've shared a couple times, and I keep referring to David because he has a national look at things as well. As I attend other national meetings, um, we have a lot of eyes on us, okay? And in the last four or five years, we've created this momentum today that we have a voice on a national stage, and it's because of <coughs> initiatives like this. I think that's just something we all need to be very proud of. So in summary, um, and then we'll open up for questions, uh, obviously you saw the, the impacts on the balance sheet from the, from the legal activities and legal challenges. Um, you'll see that we still continue to grow our geographical footprint. Um, we had a new club to come on in 2019 from Indianapolis. Uh, we've got a club that's come on board from, from as far away as Mississippi now. Uh, so we, we are truly reaching out. And, and it's really interesting, I'm going to jump ahead to membership, but the premium membership package thing has exploded. It, we, we continue year in and year out getting people from California, people from Texas that want to be part of that to help support what we're doing. As we go forward in 2019, uh, obviously grant funding and the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway is going to be a major event for us as we go forward. Al's touched on it, we'll touch on it more uh, in the future here. Tread lightly education and the training that goes along with that, that is, that is something that we want to drive across the whole region. And, and we're looking for opportunities to bring it into Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee and Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, we really want to spread this footprint that we're establishing in the, in the world of Tread Lightly. The organizational supports, uh, we'll touch on those on, on some future budget items, but I think we're going to continue to develop these relationships and nurture them. And then obviously we have two key charities uh, that we'll identify as we get into the 2019 budget, but we continue to support 
obviously Brian for Willing for a Cure and the Crawling for Reed. Um, those, those charities are close to all of us. So I think, again, that's something that we, we all need to be very proud of. <laughs> you broke it again? Yeah, just, this is just a snapshot to give everybody a couple, but that's sort of a snapshot of our year. Um, so many things that went on throughout 2018. Um, tough to cover them all as we uh, sit here in an annual meeting, but there's a lot of fun activities uh, that are represented in that. like moving the membership uh, real quick, and Bo, you can feel free to jump in, but I'd like to also share that as of 9.15 last night, we have our newest Southern Four Wheel Drive Association member and Jeeper. Katie Pass was born, so. <laughs> and, and Dad's gonna order a premium membership for it. <laughs> Congratulations, Dallas and Beth. Another thing I'd like to highlight, this is pretty cool. Um, two members of Southern won the 36 hours of Uori this past August. Um, Lucas Widener, obviously our director of membership, and Danny Michaels, uh, they knocked it out of the park. And I will footnote, they knocked it out using a Carter Tracks map. <laughs> Jake, you can pay me for that later. <laughs> but that's cool. Here's where we are for uh, 2018 as we wrap up the year. Uh, total membership, up 13% over a previous year. Uh, active club members, uh, up 20% over a previous year. And what we're seeing is a lot of the, a lot of the clubs within that, that structure are growing themselves. And it's clearly reflected in our growth. Uh, still get a lot of activity on individual members, um, and that member's maintaining itself relatively stable. Premium members, uh, as I said earlier, that, that has exceeded basically all expectations from my perspective. Clubs, we continue to grow in that area. Business members, and, and we'll talk a lot about business when we get into, into our future going forward and obviously our social media footprint continues to grow as well. This is sort of an interesting chart I put together just to give a, a snapshot to share with everyone of what's happened to the membership just over the last three year period. And, and many of you that have been around a while with me remember back in 2014, uh, we were down in this under 500 range. So really we've had, you know, amazing growth organizationally in terms of our membership throughout this period. And again, I think it reflects a lot of the things that, that we're working on and doing. My buddy Walter's not here today. He's on his way home from a Disney cruise. So um, obviously he's been the master of social media. Um, again, I won't go in and bore you uh, with all the all the little idiosyncrasies on these analytics, but it, it is something, and you know from leadership meetings and BOD meetings that we share frequently <coughs> what's going on across the platforms out there, and we continue to show very strong activity levels, communication levels, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, um, and, and, and our webpage continues to get uh, increasing traffic and one one of the things that's driving go back to education one of the things that's driving traffic on our on our web page it has been whenever we post up new fresh educational videos there's almost an instant reward on on the clicks and uh, it's, it's quite quite impressive well, we're going to skip this one real quick let's talk Briefly, first of all, any questions financially, um, 
as we move through the membership data. Okay. I, I have a question uh, going back to club memberships. As a club, are we doing anything to try to bridge the gap to the side by side? Aspect? Great topic. I think that was probably the leading topic at the NAMRAC meeting. We had a great conversation at, at breakfast this morning. And um, there's some outreach going on. We had, an example, at the meet and ride in November, for the first time, we had a, a, an organized side-by-side -side ride <laughs> led as part of the meet and ride. And obviously that's something we want to continue to do going forward. Um, we, in dealing with Aaron and Joe, uh, they're making some real nice uh, connection points between the side-by-side -side community in, in the Slade area, Eastern Kentucky, and what's going on at the Daniel Boone. One of the, one of the challenges that I've heard on a national level is how do, we, how do we connect to that community? That community seems to be not quite as organized club-wise, structure-wise, as many of us is, are in the, in the full-size vehicle uh, market. Um, <coughs> Up in the uh, Slade area, there is a little bit more organization up there, <coughs> and it looks like we may actually have our first side-by-side -side club coming on board in 2019 as a supporting member. Um, so I think we've got to use that as our model going forward in trying to connect to that marketplace. Hey, Ray, just one quick question on side-by-side. -side. I guess just kind of a general administration, but our insurance. K and K will cover side by sides. K and K will not cover ATVs. They well, they di side they side. differentiate clearly. And when we go and request on the uh, insurance certificates, um, they they but they will address and identify with side by sides. I agree. The side by sides is probably one of the biggest markets out there, and they're getting about the size of Jeep or the full size of vehicles if you look at them. Right? Uh, but I also want to make sure. Yeah, we, we did we checked that out early on. And this is this side by side discussion and, and you know Brent, you probably got the best knowledge of all of us here on that. But uh, you know, it, it's a national discussion on on you know starting at the manufacturers. How how do how do we get the tread lightly type education? How do we teach that responsibility and that accountability? And I mean that's I think that's the good stewardship role that hopefully we can demonstrate going forward. Um, you're not gonna get to everyone, but let's take one small bite at a time. Looking out into 2019 uh, at what's out there um, going forward, obviously uh, we'll continue to develop and hopefully get, get support from each of you for these regional tread lightly training opportunities. And as Al has expressed, this is something that we're fully engaged in and will support. And we, we really want to see this thing move around. Um, you know, Brett, that, it, that might be an idea thing for your event there at uh, Appalachian, you know, is you know, make, make an educational component part of that. And we'd be more than happy to be part of something like that. We have actually had uh, tread lightly who's uh, we've been that's the biggest contributor that we've had as far as the charity side the last two years. Uh, we have multiple, three different classes each day of the event. Great. Um, we're we're going to continue on, Al, um, as he did this year. We had a number of educational videos. Uh, we'll continue on with that uh, on a, as we build those topics. Organizational support, which we've touched on. Charity contributions, which we touched on. More than likely, I'm expecting something out of Colmont, Tennessee, as they start to evolve into their projects. Um, one, they'll be looking for volunteers and man hours on the ground, dirt, things of that nature. But uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that we'll see some type of financial opportunity come out of that. Daniel Boone, obviously, I think we're all very much abreast of that. And then the last one was just added this week, and I'm going to ask Al to step up as we go into this. Um, we'll go, go through these real quick. That's the educational videos.
So on the educational videos, <coughs> and I have a microphone. Hey, on the educational videos, if you have any ideas uh, of something that would be have a broad interest across our community, uh, feed those to me. And if we can find the subject matter expert, we're not putting you. You're not getting on the hood of a car and being in the video. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do a side by side educational video. Will you help us do it? Yeah, you can borrow one. Will you help us do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Al? Yes. We already have a Fred Life Defense Rules uh, video. We do. Yeah. We do. I've, I've seen that one. Uh, Jay Bird, I think, mm -hmm. stood up and taught that one. But those are just the potential right. things to do. But I think, you know, in, in this broad thing, as you see, as we're trying to develop our portfolio of what we see as potential opportunities for, for uh, 2019, obviously the educational part is part of it as well as some of these on the ground type projects. Before I move over to the organizational side, any discuss, other discussion on any of those? <coughs> Um, when we get into developing the 2019 budget, I'm prepared to make a couple recommendations, but as I expressed earlier, um, I see us continuing, our, obviously, our support of Tread Lightly, um, Orba, and United. Um, I, I will make a proposal when we get to Blue Ribbon that we pull back on our level of support until such time that we see a clearer picture of where they're going. It's not that we want to abandon them, okay, but I want a clearer picture of what that strategy is and what that strategy means to us. The other thing that, that as we go into the budget, in understanding that we've got this challenge coming up in the first part of 2019, uh, leading up to the trial on the Daniel Boone, my personal recommendation, and we'll go for approval of it when we get into the budget, is effectively to defer all these contributions until we clearly have a picture of the legal impacts on our association. It's not that we're not gonna do it, I just wanna defer it back until we make sure we have a good understanding of what the impact is on our balance sheet. <coughs> Well, I got a quick question for you. And but besides our two events, what's our major sources of income to support what's getting ready to come up at Daniel Boone? Really, when, when when it's all said and done, John, you've got basically inflow from business memberships, inflow from club memberships, but the big dollars come from the two events. Have we do we have have we restructured our business membership levels, and will they be able to come in and support a legal battle with us? Well, did you, uh, did I send you the PDF? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, and again, I don't want to jump way ahead of ourselves, but one of the things with, as you know, we adopted new bylaws in 2000. But we're, we're in the process of reaching out, obviously, to like Orba and some of the other groups out there. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. When, they're great until you start asking them for money. Right. You know, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, but back to another core question that you asked there, which we will address when we get going forward here momentarily, is um, we adopted new bylaws last year. And those were uh, registered and certified earlier this year. And that gives us the ability to modify what the board of directors and our activities look like. And one of the things that I'm proposing or will propose here shortly is a totally new position that is solely focused on building that business bridge. And, and not, it's a sole job. It's not an add-on or a piece here or a piece there type thing. Excellent. And, the, and I know we're not quite there yet, but maybe you can address this when you get there. My biggest worry was, you know, we're 501 c so we got to be real, real careful how we receive and redistribute that. Right. Right. Yeah, we're C4. C4. Correct. Right.
Um, another, another um, we touched on, a, on this earlier, and, and Flint has really been taking lead on this, but uh, I, I, we talked about engagements and so forth. One, this group, American Trails and the Coalition for Recreational Trails, as, as I mentioned earlier, they're a national federation. Uh, we're planning to attend the symposium that will be held in Syracuse, New York in April. And it is a group that we really, uh, Robert and I were talking at break, it's a group that we really want to monitor closely. Um, and I think uh, their annual membership, much like ours, is, um, um, I'll call it insignificant, $100. And I'm, I want to get our name on the, um, basically on the list that we recognize it. And then at the same time, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to, uh, to monitor their direction. A little bit like what I'm saying about Blue Ribbon. You know, we can, we can make an engagement with them, but let's also look what, what value it has coming back to us as an association. Any questions on that? Yeah. Is, that is that primarily a motorized group? It's primarily at this point, Dave, a, I'm gonna call it on the foot group, gotcha. okay? Gotcha. Um, the one thing that's really very interesting in, in, their, in their profile is their position at the Department of Transportation and the directing of recreational trail monies, okay? So they have a very active position at a, at a federal level, okay, to help direct it down to the state levels, you know, and obviously that's something that we've not been accustomed to, okay, and, and it's one of the key areas that Flint's identified that, uh, you know, again, could, could open up some other future communications there. So, right, would we have somebody that's participating with that organization what, or at least monitoring it to come back and give us feedback like quarterly on what's going on yeah, with that well, organization? Actually, um, I've asked Robert Palmer, okay, who is co-director on conservation, to basically take that chore on for 2019 so that he can report back on a leadership basis and a board basis that, that we can stay very much attuned to what they're doing and what those communications are. Gary? That, that actually was going to kind of be one of my questions as far as monitoring because as I understand, they reached out to you, is that correct? That is correct. So I think any support we get can be good, but I do think we have to look at intentions and where we go and monitor. So that was actually going to be my question as well. Uh, just recently in Knoxville, we managed to get uh, a $650,000 <coughs> for a bicycle park and $10 million bucks for an entryway to the park. Wow. wow. You got a connection yeah. point, Robert. <laughs> it's Good. Thanks, Dave. We mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking about grant opportunities, uh, these are two charities that, that we have supported over the years and will continue to support. Uh, obviously, crawling for reeds coming up in March, and then Brian. Anything you want to share, Brian, on uh, your event coming up in April? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, like I said, we appreciate uh, everybody's support. Uh, we appreciate uh, Southern Four Wheel Drive Association that supported us now for our six six years. I want to thank Winrock Park for letting us hold the, the event at uh, Winrock and. Uh, you know, we just, uh, this event's, you know, dear to my heart. Uh, a lot of people have, everybody has probably had someone has this battling cancer, and uh, especially our children. Uh, but anyway, we uh, appreciate the support of everybody. Uh, the event next year will be, or this coming up year will be uh, 2019, will be April the 13th. It's at, uh, it'll be at the trailhead, where we always set up at, at Winrock Park. Uh, Brent has been uh, very, very good. Winrock Park's been very good to us as far as, uh, you know, keeping us in line, you know, where we need to be at. So we, we appreciate, appreciate them for hosting the event. Uh, that is at Winrock Park, Oliver Springs, Tennessee. Uh, we do it in honor of a couple of good friends of ours that was uh, in the icons of four-wheeling uh, back in the day, uh, which my daughter passed away. My, 
daughter Brenda Overly, and uh, we do it in honor of uh, Jim Tenale. That was by Icon, Jim's off road. That was one of the founders of uh, Southern back years ago. Uh, D.A. Young uh, was a great friend and a uh, four wheeler. Uh, uh, he loved he loved people and loved four wheeling. And also Kenneth Spence, Spence's four wheel drive was one of our uh, dear friends and uh, started back in what we consider the old days of Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Uh, but anyway, we uh, you can check us out on Facebook, Four Wheeling for the Cure. Uh, and uh, like I say, we appreciate all the donations. And uh, this is our seventh year. Uh, St. Jude's, I've, I've been, been in contact with them, or they contacted me here at the end of the year here already. And uh, we've I got them to give me a kind of a total. We're at $140,000 that we have raised in six years. And that's, it's not bad for a bunch of four years. So uh, we appreciate it. We love everybody. And uh, like I say, see everybody. It's a one day event. Come, rain or shine, uh, raffle, auction, go ride at Twin Rock Park and raise money for St. Jude's. Thank you all. Yeah, just make sure you put a bucket out there because that's the same weekend as the Tennessee Mountain Jamboree and catch, catch that group going up the road. <laughs> we do talk about that. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, yeah. I, I got one, just one question. And it, this is probably for Al. Um, on the vids and the, uh, y'all were asking about suggestions and stuff, and he talked about the um, side to side. Um, I was actually wondering, do y'all have a video or anything going on with first aid? Our, our intention is to do uh, a backcountry first aid video. Okay. The reason I'm asking is we're actually gearing up, and we've got some uh, paramedics, we've got some EMTs coming in. We're going to be starting up a first aid class with our group, and this is going to be a progressive thing going on, and it's basically going to start out with basics and then progress up to teaching CPR and so on as it goes. So I didn't know if y'all would be interested in uh, collaborating or doing a video or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, keep us in the loop on that. Michael. I'll, I'll let you uh, pick up the ball here. Oh, what am I picking up on? Uh, Gorgeous State Park. Oh, okay. Um, there, there's not much, there's not hardly any places to ride in South Carolina, in the little corner of North Carolina where I live. Um, Gorgeous State Park has a trail that goes out the back of the state park, uh, a couple miles across the state park, and then down into some game management land. It's probably a nine mile, nine or 10 mile trail. Got to go in and come out the same trail. But recently, we, we're, we're thinking that uh, the park and the forest service is about to close that down. So I'm starting up an effort to, to get in there, uh, analyze the trails, understand what's going on, talk to the park ranger as well as the forest ranger to see what we can do to help, help them. Now, they're maintaining those trails today. We rode them a few weeks ago, and they look pretty good. So at, as a beginning, we're probably this winter going to propose doing some signage tread lightly kind of signage along those trails to try to help educate people so they don't tear them up. But uh, it's, it's, it's infancy. We don't, we're not sure what we're going to do, but uh, a bunch of us are getting together. Jim uh, with TNT and some others are helping. We'll see where it goes. Good. Thanks. Many, many of you know uh, from last year's annual meeting, uh, we put together an event planning committee and there was a lot of work done. And a lot of this was being driven obviously from the fact that uh, we were aware at that time that Sparta was uh, not gonna be here for, for 2019 going forward. One of the things that we wanted to try to understand is, you know, as we looked at our calendar and our event structures and so forth, um, you know what were our options and we we were presented at the leadership level with a number of, of options and we'll start with trail fest um, as pete mentioned earlier uh, we've made a, a decision to move trail fest to hawk pride in Tuscumbia, alabama uh, at hawk pride mountain off road uh, as mark smith the owner of the park has been very engaging uh, throughout all these dialogues as, as has been indicated. 
but we, we have a couple issues. Um, our friends at the Unlimited Off-Road Expo are moving the Louisville Expo that was traditionally the first weekend in June to Nashville the same weekend as um, <coughs> Trail Fest. And distance from Nashville to Alabama is what, an hour maybe? Hour and a half? Yeah. So this, this has become a, a relatively major discussion topic. Um, we've had a dialogue, and, and Trail Fest as history has always been that first weekend of, of May uh, as it moves <coughs> along. One of the things that we explored was the idea of pushing the date back and pushing the date back to Memorial Day weekend. Um, and that the park is available that weekend, but the, the problems that we face in May is Mother's Day, okay? You obviously can't run up against that. So we don't have a lot of options. So what I wanna do is open up a discussion on what makes sense. David? As one of the vendors and sponsors of the Off-Road Unlimited Expo, Unlimited Off-Road, whatever, yeah. um, I think it's a different crowd. I think it's a different demographic. It's been our experience that the people attending these shows are not the same people who typically attend Trail Fest. Um, the people who attend the shows are there for the lifestyle, they're there to see new products, they're there you know, for those types of things, walking from booth to booth, much like Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion. Right. Um, whereas people who are trailing at, at Trail Fest want to ride, uh, primarily. So I don't think one is going to impact the other uh, a whole lot, and that's my feedback. Uh, I think I would just leave it the way it is. Pete? You should also mention that um, that alternative uh, date is the 10-year uh, anniversary of opening uh, Hawk Ride. So it would, um, you know, it would be a reason to draw in more people as a 10-year anniversary of did, the park. I, did, I mean, can I hear other comments? Is that the first, the May 3rd? That's the first. Okay. The 23rd through 25th. Okay, that's the 10 year. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we as a board, when we've had this discussion, we really struggle with what to do with this date. And as David indicated, you know, we get in this tug of war about how much impact one's going to have on the other. John? With that being uh, Memorial Day weekend, you're probably going to have a bigger draw. It adds a day. Yes. Bo? I, I would say we're six months out from the uh, alternative date. Um, some people have already RSVP'd at other places for Memorial Day, six months out. Mm -hmm. um, it, we may be looking at not a 2019 option, <coughs> but a 2020 option which would give you 18 months of notification for people that have already planned Memorial Day vacation or have a historic Memorial Day vacation. One thing you may want to consider is that you, you will lose vendor participation competing with the mm -hmm. Off-Road Expo because right. they're going to go there because that's where Crowds. That's their, that's their I mean, that's that's what people are going there for, you know, for the same same thing. They're going there to buy stuff, so that's where they're going to go. I don't know much about the UOR Expo, but is there a way to combine the two into one giant mm -hmm. event no. or no? Um, no. no? I'm not sure that that's in Axel's okay. vocabulary. <laughs> 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 He's not into collaboration. <laughs> they they are close enough in proximity that, it's like, that yeah. you may yeah. have somebody who decides to go to the region for that weekend and spend one day at the expo and come and two deal. days of trail fest. That's or do a Saturday, Saturday only that. type thing. <coughs> no, okay, I don't mean to 
it's a, I mean, this, this is the quandary we're in, in the, but it's also one that we need to make a decision on going forward. And so, Michael? Have you, uh, have you considered maybe doing some kind of a shootout, hill climb, something to draw even the hardcore crawlers in to this event? Uh, some type of a, I don't know, a purse or something? You're, you're, when you get into that kind of competitive thing, that's when we get into insurance issues. Okay. But could the park, if they have their own insurance? Well, Tom's done that at AOP before on his own. Yes, sir. Bob? Mother's Day should be the second weekend. If you go to the third weekend, you may get people who would come into the event and then stay over to the the event in Nashville. Possibility. Say that again. So, no. so if you look at dates, I'm just saying, yeah. would the third weekend conflict with anything? The, the problem going into that, um, or I, I'm going to use myself for example, you know, for the month of, <laughs> say for the month of May, you know, I'm going to budget so much to go have fun. And, you know, if I take off the weekend before, you know, the Memorial Weekend, you you add all that up, it, it's quite expensive. I think that's a good point either day. Right. Yeah, because the way the way the, the, calendar, anyway, that, the, way the calendar, the way the calendar falls, yeah. the way the calendar falls, you got the 4th is a Saturday, which would be the traditional <laughs> date. The 11th is Mother's Day, the next weekend, the second, second weekend. And then you skip a week, and then you go to Memorial Day. David? So the question I have, I heard that the vendors that are normally at Trail Fest, at least some of them, will not be able to do this because they'll be at this. They're uh, committed to the expo, right? right. How does that hurt us financially? How does that hurt us by putting them in a position where they can't be in two places at once? How important are these vendors to this event? You know, and that's, that's, I think that's been one of the things that we've not, not struggled with, but one, we're different than a lot of other events out there and the fact that, that we are riding events. And I know some vendors, particularly on a national scale, this is not a place that is a, I'll call it a great venue to show your wares, sell stuff, things of that nature. So you're not typically coming there thinking you've got a, yeah, a big payday. They're a peripheral activity at a ride right. as opposed to being the center of attention at yeah. Maxwell. Yeah, I think it, it helps support the event, but it's not the reason for the event. Just trying to think outside the box next to Carol's suggestion here. What about moving it to the last weekend of April? Stay done. Well, yeah, Jeep Beach, yeah, you're, gonna, you're gonna get into Jeep Beach somewhere there. There's an awful lot to be said for consistency. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I was gonna piggyback on. And all these events and everything that we do it's kind of about tradition. I mean, you look at this stuff and uh, you go to these places year after year. You go hit the trail to see if your modifications on your Jeep have done better. You see the same people. And uh, the, the, these have been, you know, staples. I mean, I've, I've missed one trail fest and since, since it started. I've been, I was at the first trail fest. And, and to me, things like that are more important than, uh, I'm not going to the expo to go look at a new vendor or anything. I'm going to see my friends and ride with my friends. And the dates aren't going to conflict with me about that. It's, it's about the tradition to me. And at, at this point, now that I have a daughter, it's, you know, if she can be there and everything else, it's about bringing those traditions on to her. And I know, like Brian Overly, I mean, his, his family is multi-generational. I mean, you're talking three generations right there in his family that go to, you know, get to run. So that's, you know, it, as long as everybody can make it and their schedule works out, that, that's the most important thing and not playing around with others. Carol? Is this going to be the first and only time that that comes to Nashville, or is this going to be No, it'll, it's, an annual, it's, it's, it's intended to be an, an annual event. Okay. On that weekend going forward. Right. Okay. How dare they not check with us? 
<laughs> yeah, I said the, I said the same thing, David. Because okay. yeah. my thought is, I understand what David is saying about it's two different groups, but this being the first time that that has actually come this far south, I think you're going to have more people just interested to say, what is it all about? Right. That would like to go to it for a one-time thing. John? But I don't know. Back in the old days, we, we used to have our years planned out. Memorial Day, we'd be up on, I believe it was, Mount Eagle Mountain. And then Labor Day, we'd be over Fracturing Mountain. You, know, you always knew that you were going to be there. Those events were huge on those weekends. The vendors were always there, and you had like thousands of people show up. Joe? I understand and appreciate the, the sentiment about tradition. That That is important. But on this level of, of business, it's, it really comes down, with the, the money is, is a big part of it. And if the vendors are telling us that they're not going to be able to participate <coughs> in our event, and if they are a big enough portion of, of helping supply you know, prizes for raffles, and th if their presence is important to the success of this event, we really need to factor that in and weigh it against the, the tradition, if they're not going to be able to make it, how does that financially impact, um, you know, trail fence? Right. Brent? Uh, I'll say up front that I, I prefer, personally would prefer it to be the first weekend in May. That's what it's always been. I like that. It's cooler. I, I hate that Dixie Run has moved back earlier because it's it always seems to That's be the next topic. <laughs> much, much warmer than it used to be. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But if you're talking about it from the financial aspect, more so than what the vendors are going to provide, <coughs> your turnout on a holiday weekend will be significantly higher. Um, just based on just, <coughs> experience. Just based on my experience, you have people who have an extra day. Uh, I think uh, Brett's event, that's, that is one of the reasons that it does extremely well. Personally, I want to be at home on the day off. Uh, but, but I think if your goal is to generate revenue, you will do more on the <coughs> So, so if, just for an answer to the question we've now heard twice is, what is the economic impact of these vendors on trail? Largely through the raffle. Largely through the raffle. That's a pretty but, important part. And, and that, that leads, to give you an example, on just Dixie Run alone, you know, that was probably in the neighborhood of thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars 14000 Or are they going to pull their donation just because they're physically not there? Probably it's it's not. probably not, but but it's interesting. A lot, so much of that stuff on the, on the raffle donations comes trickling in at, like a snowball at the last minute. And so it's just cleaner if, if, if they're there. Dave? I'd love to, like to offer some perspective as one of the vendors. Um, typically, we prefer events like Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion. I just use that as an example because people are familiar with it, where we can bring in a tractor trailer and set up and bring in employees and bring in Jeeps and, and spend tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and everyone is there focused on seeing the new products, the new Jeeps, how they're built and so forth. Trail riding events for us are not as successful because people are out on the trails. They're not in front of our trailer. Um, and this is true nationwide, this is true among the other vendors as well. If everyone's out having fun at Easter Jeep Safari and we don't see them until 5 or 6 o'clock at night, uh, it's not very cost effective for us. It costs us tens of thousands of dollars to move tractor trailers all over the country. Um, what we do in D instead is we support the events through raffle prices. And we do that again nationwide. And we have always supported Dixie Run and Trail Fest in by sending raffle prizes, you will usually see a very small presence, if any at all, 
Uh, and we're in Atlanta, we're regional, we're right here, and we've supported Southern over the years, but not by bringing in tractor trailers and groups of employees and track, you know, and, and vehicles. Yeah, I, I think in fairness on the vendor side, in recent years, we've had more success by the, from the regional vendor, the local shops and the local vendors than the national type, just from what David's explaining. Do we know of any conflicts on Memorial Day weekend with the vendors? Are they already going someplace else? Not that we've identified. You know, and that's a problem. That's one of the problems. Going back to Bo's point, a lot of the na on a national scale, okay, those vendors have their calendars. If not done, they've been done. You know, so I, I think we. I, 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 I won't, um, I'll get to you in a minute, Gary. But I, I just want to get to a point where we can have a consensus that so it makes sense. So yeah, I'll make a motion, notwithstanding anybody's position here. Does that all make sense? I'll make a motion. We move this to Memorial Day. Second. Second. All in favor? Any follow-up comments? Yeah, I got one. Um, because if you do move it to Memorial Day, wouldn't you want to move the event for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday instead of a Thursday, Friday? Yeah, pro Saturday? it probably will end up having, I think, as you said, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and all of a sudden, Monday becomes a travel day. Right. So really, you can do it with you know the one day. I, I, yeah. Christina? Um, the expo that's in Nashville, we have a booth there, correct? We will. So our, in, our intent is, and in fact, one of the things that, that I've wanted to talk to Axel about once we got past this meeting is also bringing in the tread lightly component. Right, so I think that that could actually be um, in favor of this alternative option because of the fact that you have a booth, you can maybe have some people like some kind of marketing piece for it, maybe, I don't know, right. kind of ticket or raffle. Let's move on to the next fun little topic. Well, hold on. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. There's a motion and a second on the floor. And I ask all in favor? Oh, it's already in order? Yes. I thought we were back to discussion. No, I just said last, close, last I heard, comments. I heard all in favor. I didn't hear an all opposed or any yeah. abstentions. We're good. I, mean, I don't know. What was the count? Did you know? Unanimous. Oh, it was unanimous? Yeah. No, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not completely unanimous. <laughs> We got Brian to lift his hand. We're good. Yeah. I don't care what you add. I just want to move Yeah, thank you. Next thing, calendar challenge. Uh, as, as you know, we have uh, committed in 2019 Dixie Run to go to Adventure Off Road. Um, Brent's comment exactly. Over, over the years, the date on Dixie Run has crept forward. Okay, and, and I wanted to throw out the challenge that. I've all you talk tradition. I'll go back to you. That was always, you know, in my mind, Dixie Run, and and setting aside other precedents, I I would like to see us move back to that more traditional date. Move it back. Too hard. <laughs> okay. Can I have a motion? A motion. We do that. Second. All in favor? Aye. David. Any, anybody opposed? <laughs> Is that good, David? No, it's Right. I'm sorry. I'm in favor of it, but the reason it was moved. Greg brought up vendors couldn't be there on that particular week. Because they were moving west for shows out west. So. Let, let me make a comment on that, though, David. I think you can back me up. It doesn't matter where you look now. The four-wheel drive, the Jeep thing is moved so much. I, I think there's events across the country everywhere every weekend right now. Yeah, it's... So it's we, and everybody seems to be, yeah, when something gets successful, it looks like everybody tries to copy. So I think you would have a hard time finding any place on the calendar. Even with, when we get a little bit further here and you <laughs> see what our potential calendar looks like for 19, it's, you know, it's full. But, Ray, if we, <coughs> if we can set the dates for these events for years going well, forward, then, then, then we can work with those vendors, and a lot of times they'll put us on their calendar right. before somebody else gets on. Worth I've had them say that a lot more several predictable. times. Right. Right. Oh. I'd, I'd like to make a few comments about Dixie Run, the structure, and where it's been. Uh, and it's nothing against where we've had it, but I think overall the impression most people I've talked that is a hard
hard format. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what it does is limit the growth of that to some extent. And, and I agree that the activities at Sparta specifically have really limited it, right. I, my opinion, over the last couple of years. I think, again, financially and organizationally, to make that thing grow, we've got to get to an area that's bigger, got a bigger variety of uh, yeah, trails, and I think also our mentality going into that, and, and I'm going to be honest, years ago I was the first one that moved from $39 to $79, and we said it couldn't be done. Chief January, I knew that we had $750 a bid to go up there, and I had 28 states sold out in 23 minutes when we cut it off. I'm saying we can structure this to where it becomes a lot <coughs> bigger than what it is today. And, uh, but, but I think it's got to be a broader range of trails to get away from that stereotype. This is only I agree. big Jeeps and hardcore Jeeps. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, and, and to your point, Bob, I think one of the things, and we've done this in some other Trail Fest models at AOP, we've got, you know, we've got a wine ride we can do. We've got some state forest we can do. We can do more excursion type riding out of there. You've got Coppinger Cove you can get out into from there. Hopefully in 2020, 2021, we'll be able to get the Colmont. So all of a sudden we get, a, as you are indicating, a much more diverse set of trail systems. Does the record reflect that we're in the most of the people in the room? We don't need a special ride to hear about wine. Touche. <laughs> One other thing I want to mention too, on the fence, I've also learned that people can ride anytime you want. I mean, you can, you can get a weekend ride as far as just trail riding. It's not a big deal. The biggest thing you get from events is seeing friends. Okay, the camaraderie that begins to exist, and you build on that to where it's it's almost if you say ditch you run, it's like a family reunion. Right. You're getting people continually to come back and you build on that more than you do on a specific trail. Um, and I just think broaden our thinking on how you run events. Um, we we can do better than what we've been where the numbers go up. I got no hang up. There's no hang up with Winrock like whatsoever. Winrock has, you know, again, it's large, and there are all types of trails. Um, I run that, I do some stuff on TWRA property, the sand lines. Uh, great trail ride, but I'm just saying, the opportunity, and like a Winrock, or specifically, either way you want to look at it, we can get a lot broader I want to touch on what you're saying. I'm still fairly new to like expanding all of my stuff, and I have always thought the Dixie Run was like rock buggies. Like, yeah, it's, 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 it's got that that's yeah. so stereotype. And I just wanted to touch on that because I feel like if people know that it's not just for those people, you will get a lot more. And I'm not saying eliminate anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, expand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, you know, as, as, as many of you have been around, I mean, we've expanded our reach into what I call the JK community substantially, and it continues to build with clubs like Mule Town and Jeeps and Wrenches and so forth and so on. But uh, as you said, we got to build on that. You gotta have to get a little more PC now. It's JL. Yeah, well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm waiting for the what do they call it? It's not the scrambler, the, the pickup truck. The gladiator, yeah. Gladiator, yeah. Last comment, and I want to move on. <clears throat> Brent. One of the, when we were, uh, were looking at moving Dixie Ranch, Dixie Ranch, <coughs> which turned into moving the Trail Fest as well, Windrock Park was, was looked at. And one of the reasons that I heard that we weren't selected after that was because of our alcohol policy. Um, I, don't think I, don't, I don't know if that's the case or not, but sure. I, I, I want I won't I bring that up as a not a one drop parking boy, but Southern Fall Drive Association used to have a very strict policy, no alcohol on the trails. And I have been to uh, 
uh, every Dixie run since I was 16. I've been to every trail fest except for this past year since it started, and it's changed a lot. Uh, both, it is very common at when you're sitting around camp at 10 o'clock at night to see, or 2 o'clock in the morning, to have people going out to ride, music blaring, yeah. alcohol on the trails, and if, if there's ever a, in, in, an accident with alcohol, there's a good chance that our insurance company will cancel us, and, and our, it doesn't matter what events we have, we can't, we can't do it without insurance. Right. So I would encourage the association to look at that, and you know, sometimes it's not the most uh, politically correct thing, or not, it is politically correct, but you may piss some people off by enforcing the policy, but it's worked well for us, and I would encourage the association to do the same. I think the view that you would make bad would far be fewer than the ones you would make bad. Do, do we have such a policy? Yes. 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 And then I make a motion that we reaffirm that policy and make every effort to enforce it at our events. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Opposed? Well, that's unanimous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <have> <laughs> no, you are standing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brent. This leads us into um, obviously building our calendar for 2019. Um, one of the things that immediately comes up is that we've traditionally, the last several years, done three a year, sort of a, a spring, summer, fall kind of scenario. By moving Trail Fest, obviously, back to Memorial Day, it, it's too close, bottom line. So really what I'm envisioning in 2019 is a March-April meet and ride, and we are open to locations. Uh, had some discussions about possibly late later. The last time we tried to do Royal Blue in early March, we ran into uh, some significant weather. <laughs> um, that's a possibility. Windrock was brought up as a possibility in, in that March-April timeline to do a meet and ride, which we had done a while back. Um, and it almost makes sense that we forego that June date because of the move of Trail Fest. And then, uh, we've mentioned earlier, we've identified uh, the November date for the fourth annual ride at, uh, at the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway. We've just dealt with the Trail Fest and Dixie Run dates. Obviously, other major supporting events will be the Crawling for Reed and the Four Willing for a Cure um, that we will be sponsor or be supporting as well. When we put that all together, that's what a 2019 calendar starts to look like. Guys. And just remember that uh, in 2019, the, the Backcountry Byway Meet and Ride will now be a two-day event. Yeah, the intent is as we build the Meet and Ride for, for Daniel Boone for November of 19. Uh, we were talking about this morning earlier to extend that out to a two-day event. And we're also talking about building in some tread lightly education as part of that that two day event. I have a suggestion. Yeah. Um, for the instead of doing the June uh, meet and ride, could we do something say in July, and we could do it at the Cove. And the reason I suggest the Cove, um, there's a lot of swimming holes, there's a lot of caves. There's a lot of things that can be done through there where you're not just <coughs> sweating to death in your Jeep. Yeah. Um, Any thoughts on that? We've done a meet and ride down there before. Or, well, we've done a meeting there. It was before the meet and ride. Yeah, yeah. We did it at the Trials Training yep. Center, yeah. which they have facilities to support all of us. Yeah, I agree with you, Pete. You could do, Let's, and you could theoretically turn that into a two-day event. Yeah. Um, Let's, Let's take that to the leadership as we get into 2019, because we have plenty of time to plan on that, but that's that's a valid option. Okay. What I'd like to do now is just take a real quick 10-minute break. 
It's uh, almost 11.50, be back at noontime, and we will go through the fun part of elections and nominations and those type of talks. Thank you. As we uh, get started real quick, we had a question come in via Facebook because we were moving rather fast through the, uh, the calendar portion of today's meeting. Um, what we've agreed on, to just restate it, is that we will be moving the Trail Fest date to Memorial Day weekend at Hawk Pride. We will be moving tr Dixie Run date to the traditional first weekend of October. At the leadership and board level, we will be identifying a late March date for a Windrock Oil Blue type meet and ride. Um, Pete recommended, which we will be following up on, is a July potential Coppinger's Cove meet and ride. And then obviously the third one will be our November 2nd date on the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway. I believe that is probably the major events there. I mentioned earlier um, that we created new bylaws last year. They were voted on at, th at this meeting in 2017. Um, as a matter of record, those are on the web page, uh, but they were notarized and filed on March 6th of this year. Um, One of the things the bylaws allows us to do is to be much more modern in our structure and the interpretation on how we apply that. And you'll see where that is gonna go here in a moment. Uh, but by resolution, we have the ability to create certain roles that more closely aligns with our mission and goals going forward. <coughs> One thing I want to move into quickly, um, you, I shared with you earlier um, the actual results from 2018 and some of the financial um, challenges that we see in 2019. This is a proposed budget um, that we are presenting for your approval today um, for 2019. And the numbers reflected here very closely align the actual numbers that we experienced in 2018. <coughs> Any questions? Pete? The director's and officer's insurance, is that more than what it was last year? Those lines are <coughs> swapped. Good pickup, Pete. Uh, $1,500 is the, oh, that's off, it's off. What that is, in our insurance this year, there's a line missing there. That's what the, the general membership is. We, we have additional event insurance that we incur during the course of the year because each club has the ability to pick up you know insurance. And that, that ran about $5,000 this year. Okay. Then the DNO is $1,500 and we're just off one line there. I've looked at it so much I missed that. Anyway, do, can I have a motion to um, to approve this 2019 budget. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any negative hands? <laughs> Thank you. Um, as we were talking about in, in the, uh, when we were talking about the uh, bylaws, um, what the bylaws allow does is it defines these four positions as permanent positions as part of the, the association. And, and what we're looking to do is to try to reshape the members of our board of directors to more closely reflect the activities that we're going forward with. Obviously, uh, another role that has been with us many, many years is director of membership. Uh, currently, Lucas and, and uh, Bo are serving in that role. We also have a director of conservation where Flint and Robert are serving in that role. Proposing some new things. We want to create a director of education. And this allows us to more closely focus on our commitments to the education component of the association. 
The next one is we want to create a director of recreation. And this person will really focus on overseeing the event management, um, the schedule, the planning, the interaction as we go forward on meet and rides. Director of communication. We've, we've had, and many of us know this over the years, we've had uh, PR positions and things. It's always been fuzzy, fuzzy area. And what we're trying to do here is bring a lot more clarity to the way the board is structured. And obviously, director of communication will deal with our web management, our social media footprint, the, the electronic side of our communication that goes out to the membership. And the last role that we look or we're looking to create is um, a director of business development. The business component, you go back in history, you know, when Greg was here with us all the time, he was in the business every day. I mean, that's what he did. And so he naturally had all those connections. The business side and its connection to the association has always been somewhat of a side job, okay? And we, we really feel that we're missing opportunities in engaging the business community. We're, and whether it's, we're talking about uh, support of the association, whether it's support of events, and we want to really define that role and look at our overall model of how we deal with the business community and what we what value we can present to them uh, as an association. So what I'm what I'm asking for now is a uh, is a motion by res our resolution to accept this structure uh, for our board of directors going forward in 2019. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. You still standing? Okay. Another quick topic uh, that I want to touch on, and then we'll get, get further into the uh, board structure. Um, as I shared earlier, uh, we've been very, very fortunate um, for five years in a row to have the United Four Wheeler of the Year come out of our association. I think that's a, a tribute to all of us. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is charge Robert specifically um, in 2019 to uh, work with Flint and the Board of Directors to uh, identify a potential candidate that's a member of our association. So if you have ideas, please share them with Robert because we would like to make a recommendation uh, for this award for year six by May of 2019. Okay, as I've shared, we're in, in midterms right now on four positions, as we define. Obviously, president, uh, treasurer, director of membership, and the director of conservation. With the intent, and this is really, you've seen more of this in recent years, what we're trying to do is create this concept where there's this, this I'll call it understudy, that is learning the role as, and I'll use Flynn as an example, as, as he unwinds, Robert is upwinding to become the next nominee for 2020 as the Director of Conservation. But this is where we are today on <coughs> fixed positions. Based on the format that we just looked at, um, this is the beginning of the way the organization will look in 2019. Currently, we have two nominees that have been presented to the board for vice president for 2019-20. Um, Jay Bird is not with us. Uh, I think, without understating it, you know, many of you know Jay, Jay was a past president. Uh, he has come forward uh, with wanting to step back into a leadership role and has put his name into um, into the hat for the vice president's position. Um, as we did the last go, whoops, last go around, um, we had co-vice presidents on the last cycle, and I will be recommending that we, we consider co-vice presidents again this time around. The other individual that has put their name forward um, is Aaron Roddy. 
Um, Aaron, if you want to take a second and just, I mean, most of us know you, but anything you want to say? Uh, nothing much. Let's find your microphone. Yeah, I'll just sort of give a little background. Step up there, would you? Today's your. So, um, hopefully you guys can hear me, but uh, the reason why I sort of put my name is, you know, as me, I'm a younger guy that's coming into this. Um, I've been around off-roading for over 25 years. Um, I've got started when I was a kid. My grandpa started it. Um, I've been helped out with major events. Um, some of you guys might remember Eastern Rock Crawling Championships and We Rock Crawling Championships. Um, I used to help direct those um, back in the day, but um, just with the clubs, it's, we always look at how we can get younger generations and, and that's one of the things I hope to focus on is the younger generations and getting them back in the four wheel drive. For, you know, when we, you know, older generations move out, you have a younger generation that you don't have to try to re-educate or re-teach or already educated to take over the organization to teach the future generations coming in. So um, that's sort of what I'm running for. Good. Thanks, Aaron. The, the way we envision, uh, and I've talked to both Aaron and Jay about this, uh, the way we envision the splitting up of roles, and one of the challenges after after the board is identified and voted on this year, one of the things that we, we're going to put a challenge out to each board member to basically create a snapshot of what their goals are for 2019 so that we can begin to clearly define some measurable progress as we work through the year. And uh, in talking with Jay and Aaron, one of the specific concepts is, is break up the various directorships and roles and have each one of them focus on like three key areas and the other one focus on three other areas so that we can make sure that our directors have the resources and the assets and the materials and the tools that something's not falling through the cracks. Uh, so trying to take a real proactive approach to that. Secretary, Amy back there, she, uh, she's very quiet, but she, uh, she turns around our minutes and notes incredibly fast. She has agreed to hang out another year or so with me, so uh, I thank you very much. One of the things that we want to do, uh, Doyle, as I indicated, is in midterm of his, his term, um, and uh, we're coming up on time where we need to create a co-treasurer. And uh, Ted Macias, okay, uh, has uh, volunteered himself to, uh, to step into that role. I'd like, Ted, if you would, just take a few minutes and introduce yourself and. Yeah. I'm not Ted Macias. I'm relatively, us. <laughs> relatively new to the off-road community. I think this is my third year in. I've gotten a chance to meet an awful lot of people in three years with the volunteering that we've done, whether it was at Trail Fest or at Dixie Road the last few years. And really, I got into it, uh, really, as a customer. As a customer, and got a chance to meet John and his family, and they introduced me into the community. And uh, it's been a passion of mine for the last few years, both me and my son, getting a chance to interact and, and build a good bond with just uh, excited to be here and see what we can do to contribute to the group. Uh, a little bit about background with me on it from a uh, treasure side of it. I don't have any treasure experience, but I do have 28 years of running business uh, and the last 22 years uh, with one company alone. So uh, we've driven profits, sales, and everything else. And uh, just have, glad to, to talk to you guys about any of that to give you a little bit more insight of what, uh, what I do on my day to day. Great, thanks, Ted. Uh, I have a question. Uh, and it's not too personal, but um, so this is the last year that Doyle can serve as treasurer. Our, right? our new bylaws have a six year term limit, right. and he's finishing up year five. Right, okay. Director of Communication, I think the name that goes along with this one's pretty obvious. Um, Walter's been a major driver um, in our communication and developing a lot of the growth over the last several years. 
Director of Business Development. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have a, a relatively new member of our association, Christina Camp Campanella. Okay? But uh, uh, she works in professional business development in the healthcare industry on an everyday basis. And I'd like to have Christina step up and do a little snapshot of her and introduce herself. <laughs> All right. It's like getting an award or something. No. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Christina. I am fairly new to the to the operating community. It's been about almost a year that I've been in it, but I feel like I kind of hit the road running and um, have had incredible experiences and met some incredible people and been um, very fortunate. I'm very passionate about the off-road community. So. In terms of that, I, I am grateful for the fact that I can go to all these parks and learn on a daily basis and be become a better um, off-roader as well as just you know women empowerment and how well we ride, right? Um, in terms of my professional, um, I've, I've probably been doing business development for about, I don't know, 10 to 12 years around there. Um, but I've also done a lot of work in terms of creating sponsorship levels or governance structures around you know, how can you have a sustainable membership in terms of businesses and vendors over periods of years, right? So you, we won't have to have a conversation where who's going to be the vendor at this event because they've already signed up for the next two years. So it's really kind of trying to figure out what that looks like, what the rewards are, and making sure that we have other opportunities to look for new clubs to join or new vendors or new support or new associations. I think, as you know, we had indicated earlier, I think that we, this gives us an opportunity to really look at our structure and how we go forward on a very creative basis. And I, and I, I personally am very excited that we got a set of fresh eyes that um, you know can look at what we have done versus what we may be able to do if we structure it differently going forward. I, I got one question on this. I see these last two positions here. There's only one person versus no. Yeah. At the, at this point, and we were we are more than well. Now I do have a volunteer. I will add that. I'm glad you said that. Uh, he doesn't want to take on a full role, but Dallas Pass and the Foothills Jeep Club is already stepped up to be a volunteer with Walter on on the electronic IT type stuff. That's what he does. But he's also a father as of last night. So. Um, but yeah, we, we will expand these roles, John, as people become available to us. The next one I'm really excited about, um, as you know, Al has served the last two years in a vice president's role, but with a, an extreme focus on the educational component of what we do. And uh, in creating the director of education, I personally can think of no one better to nominate Ben Al Sweeney for Director of Education. <laughs> and last, <laughs> the Director of Fun. I think that's what he calls himself. Again, we, we, we're, we want to start to really look at the, I'll call it the recreational components of what we're doing on our schedule, what we're doing at our events, and again, I'm trying to create this very focused look at how we are organized and how we go forward. At this junction, um, you know, Pete Muir has uh, offered himself up uh, for this director of fund position. And, uh, and I will add to that, Pete, uh, I've been uh, approached this after or this morning that you may have an assistant in the wings here very closely with uh, Moose. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Halstead's son is out there willing to, to do whatever he can to assist us in this recreation area. Hey, it's good to be here today. He's one of my Boy Scout operations today. At this point, what I'd like to do is try to look at this as an overall slate, but are there any nominations from the floor? I move the nominations to be closed and the slate be accepted by acclamation. Okay. We should solicit input from the Facebook folks. Okay. For, give it like two minutes to see if anybody replies. Fair enough. Pending, okay. pending any electronic notifications. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Say that right so they can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Any any nominations from 
as Southern members from the Facebook stream, you know, please post up immediately. We're, we're online. Any other nominations from the floor? Anything coming up? Amy Claiborne said she'd be glad to help Pete with fun. I, we can we can add Amy Claiborne to uh, to the, the co-director of recreation. Build a team, Pete. I think it would be a fun team. Our, our, our. <laughs> As presented, can I have now have a motion to accept the nominations with the addition of Amy Claiborne to the director of recreation? So moved. Second. Second. Rather than vote on each one, we're doing it in a package. Okay. okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Wait a minute. What about what about Moody? Is that taking him out of the room? No. Well, you want him on the board, or you want him to? Uh, well, let's, let's put him as an assist. I was just bringing the message. Yeah. Here. Okay. We'll, we'll put him as an assist to director of education. Is his actual name in? Sean. <laughs> yeah. We don't we don't know his real name. <laughs> <laughs> we think Dave is his dad. <laughs> For sure, <Matt>. Okay. <coughs> so moved with the addition of Amy. That will be our 2019 board of directors. No objection on the Facebook. No objection on Facebook noted. Okay. I'm confused. Do we not? Are there two candidates for vice president? Yes. And we're, yeah. we're, and we're accepting them as co vice presidents. Oh. oh. So we actually. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, which we did, uh, Brent, the previous cycle as well. And, and really what the idea, and why you bring that up, is what I've talked to Jay on specifically is to let him have focus on membership, conservation, and education. And then I'm going to have Aaron focus over here with communication, business development, and recreation. So each guy is going to have some real specific focus of how we're moving forward in 2019. Right before we, before we get off of this, the, our new bylaws let us create these positions. That is correct. Be a resolution. And the folks chosen for these positions are full-fledged board members. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Voting board members. They're voting board members. When we have dual people in a position, how will we handle that in the voting? And if we haven't thought about it, we need to think about it, which it Let's, just came up to me, yeah, yeah. okay? We'll have to bring that to the bylaws and the board okay. for the next meeting. All right. I, I think that is addressed in the bylaws by, yeah. by members, but if not, we need to. If not, we'll <laughs> make an amendment to yeah. it. We need not to. if there's two. Um, okay. It's all good. Thank you, everyone. That's it. That's our 2018 annual meeting. What's that? Good. Motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? All in favor? Okay. And rumor has it we're going to Outback.